Hey book friends, I'm so excited to have you here. You're about to listen to the audiobook for Austin Unscripted, which is a contemporary retake, retelling of Jane Austen's Persuasion. It's one of my favorites and I hope you love it too. If you do, make sure you hit that subscribe button, like, comment, share it, tell your friends about it. Hope you're doing well and happy listening. Austin Unscripted, a second chance romance. Love, Austin, Book 3. Written by Brittany M. Mills. Copyright 2019. Narrated by Lorena Hoops. Audio copyright 2020. Chapter 1. Running a hand through his hair, Carson Carver's insides burned with irritation. What do you mean this is the best opportunity I'm going to get? His agent, Sterling Wallace, stood in front of him in the empty locker room of the Boston Breeze. His eyes darted about, meaning he wasn't entirely comfortable with the conversation. Carson wasn't happy about it either. When he'd asked his agent to find ways for him to stay in the city, he didn't think reality show contestant would even be an option. With his lungs on fire from skating, even after practice, his brain was still fuzzy, trying to comprehend everything Sterling was saying. He pulled his foot up, untying his skate and wiping the leftover ice from the blades. Sterling sat down on one of the locker benches, his legs bouncing up and down. You've told me to do everything I can to keep you here. Being the main guy on the suitor is going to help your image. Help my image? Carson broke in. The vein near his temple popped out, a throbbing starting in his forehead. This wasn't something he wanted to talk about. With a quick motion, Sterling walked toward Carson, phone out. This was at the newsstand this morning, Carson. The image showed today's newspaper for the Boston world. The bold words proclaiming, Hockey bad boy hits more than the puck. A picture of him standing next to his car in the middle of a pileup on Route 3 stared back at him. How did people get these photos? At least it's not the worst thing they've printed. Guilt ran through him as he thought of past mistakes. His mother, if she was still alive, wouldn't be happy about seeing another article with her son in it, especially when it wasn't his fault. The newspapers used to showcase his skills on the ice, but lately, it seemed to home in on all the mistakes. When had things gotten so bad? Keeping his voice at a normal volume, he said, You think that doing this reality show will help me stick around Boston? Listen, Carson, you're a great skater, a skilled athlete, but the Breeze needs someone who's got their head on straight who'll do everything to help the team win the Stanley Cup at the end of the season. Sterling paused for a moment. You're not a bad guy. I think you've just been labeled that for too long. We need to show management your good side. Carson stood, unable to sit still any longer. He scrubbed his face with his hands and took a few steps across the length of the locker room beneath the Boston Breeze arena. Why, me? he said, almost rhetorically. You've got good friends. The show is sponsored in part by a matchmaking company here in town, Love Austin. Realization dawned. Parker. Carson began his career in Michigan, but it had been his dream to play for the Breeze since he was young. He'd been traded back to Boston toward the middle of last season, and even though they'd been knocked out of the postseason early, it was like a dream come true. But it was returning to rowing, which he'd loved back in high school, that helped him meet Parker and the other guys who rowed on the Charles River every Saturday morning. He'd met Meg Austin a couple weeks ago when they'd gotten together with their rowing group for dinner at his restaurant, Top Shelf. Sterling nodded. Meg suggested you to the film crew, and they contacted me. Carson frowned. I've got a full schedule as it is with workouts and trainings. How am I supposed to squeeze in a knockoff of The Bachelor? 
We'll make it work. Make sure you get workouts in before taping, and then schedule any of the bigger trips around your schedule. It will be great for the fans. It's the off-season anyway, so you can relax. With a sigh, Carson shuffled his feet with each step. I can't if I want to stay here long term. You really think this will boost my image? Sterling flashed him a wide grin. Are you kidding? What better way than to show everyone who you really are, the hometown boy who's been misunderstood? Thinking back to the few snippets he'd seen of The Bachelor, he asked, Do I actually have to marry the girl? He wanted to choke on the last words, worried that by saying them, it cemented his future. All he could see in his mind's eye were women fawning over him, making a big fool out of themselves, and him. If there was one thing he didn't like, it was looking like a fool. Auburn hair and light green eyes popped into his mind, and it took everything to seal the door shut again. Eight years and you still can't forget, can you, Carson? Sterling walked over and rested a hand on Carson's shoulder. You can do whatever you want. There are no stipulations on this, as far as I know. Quirking an eyebrow, Carson asked, Am I allowed to make some of the rules? I, well, I don't know. If you can, are you in? Sterling asked, hope in his voice. Carson squirmed. Post-game media interviews and press conferences were a struggle for him, as they only ever asked about what happened off the ice. What would his life be like under the microscope of a full-time camera? Then again, maybe Sterling was right, and it would be to his advantage. Find out that information and I'll decide. Looking at his phone, he could see the end of May was two days away. Instead of taking time off after the season, he'd been progressively kicking things up a notch with each training, hoping to master some of his weaknesses. His image was on that list, but did he have time to squeeze in dates for days? Sterling waved goodbye and left the room. How'd he get into a mess like this anyway? He could blame a lot of things, things that happened the last time he'd lived in Boston, but that wouldn't be fair to her. Pulling out his phone, he scrolled until he found his good friend, Brennan Peters, in his contacts and dialed. Hey, Carson, what's up? Not much, man. Do you have time for lunch? Talking it over with someone might help with the decision. I'm just finishing up one of my baking classes with Lexi, but I can meet you in a bit. Taking a deep breath, Carson said, Yeah, that will be great. Hanging up the phone, he felt a measure of relief. This was something he wished he could talk to his parents about, get their opinion on the offer. His dad would probably make it a point to say he wouldn't have to do a show like this if he'd kept his drinking under control from the beginning. But he'd been sober for three years now, and maybe someday the media would move on to another topic when it came to him. Maybe a reality show would be the best option for that. Feed them a new topic to help them forget the unfortunate circumstances that led him to three different teams in five years. But he was with the Breeze now, and he wouldn't ruin that chance. Chapter 2 Ruby Hunter sat in the waiting area of Love Austin, nervous for the news Meg had for her. She'd met the head of the matchmaking company almost two months ago when she'd come in to redeem a gift certificate her parents had given her. Instead of the matchmaking package, she'd signed up for one of the improvement classes the company offered instead. As an accountant who owned her own business, coupled with the fact that she worked from home, she didn't meet people all that often. When she did, it was usually painful for both her and the other person. She didn't like sharing about herself, but even if she did, her mind usually went blank as she tried to think of what to say. While most were content to have a listening ear, others were surprised when nothing more than two to three word answers came out. The worst was when the stuttering kicked in. Her body somehow registered the embarrassment of it and she'd start shaking. She hadn't always been that bad, not since 
She shook her head. It was too hard to go there. Dr. Susan Fausch, a psychiatrist who taught the Social Communication for Introverts class, had met with Ruby over the past several months. Ruby had gone in for one-on-one, twice a week, and then attended a group class on Wednesday nights. She'd made some progress, but she definitely wasn't cured if she was so worried about what Meg wanted to tell her. When Meg's assistant Tiffany had called earlier that morning to come in as soon as possible, Ruby feared the worst. Were they canceling the class? She hoped not, because it was something she now looked forward to, after the chest-tightening worry of those initial few weeks. Meg popped her head out of her office and waved Ruby in. Thanks for coming in, Ruby. How was your week? Hesitating, Ruby said, Fine. Still recovering from tax season. She laughed a bit, and Meg grinned. I can only imagine what that's like probably like this office after Valentine's Day. She paused a moment, pulling out a few papers and setting them on the desk. How are things going with you and Dr. Fausch? She's been very positive about your progress. That was a good sign. I like her. She is very patient. Ruby tightened her jaw, wishing she could will the stuttering to go away forever. I'm sure you're wondering why I called you in here. I have an opportunity for you. Okay, was all Ruby could think to say. Wrapping her arms around her middle, she pulled in tight, hoping Meg would reveal her purpose and get rid of the suspense. Meg flashed her a bright smile, and Ruby forced one. First off, I know you didn't want to be matched up when you first came in. But we still have everyone take the tests, as it helps us figure out where we can help you best. Because of the results from your test, your name came up as a match for four guys when I was running the program yesterday. Ruby looked at the desk, knowing the file contained the names of her matches. She searched her mind, wondering if she really wanted to know who they were. I thought you usually only do the best three. Why four? With a nod, Meg said, Yes, three is usually the number we give people, but the search parameters I put in are for a special project. Before I show you the first three, I wanted to extend an offer to you. The words took over Ruby's brain, and her mind went blank. Offers were for people who did amazing things, or at least had the potential to. Ruby's simple routine kept her from freaking out over the littlest things, especially meeting in groups. Yes, she'd learned a lot from the classes and from the other attendees, but she didn't want to risk overdoing it. Meg continued, Our company is helping to sponsor an upcoming reality show. It will be called The Suitor, and 12 ladies from our system will be the ones vying for the main guy. Ruby watched as Meg paused, her eyes searching for something on Ruby's face. Your name came up in that search. Ruby raised her eyebrows, her eyes flitting about the room. Pressing a hand to her chest, she hoped her lungs would fill with air again. Me? How? Leaning forward, Meg gave her a reassuring smile. I don't tell many of my clients this, but when you took the test, it sorts you into several categories. Basically, each client falls under the personality of one of Jane Austen's leading characters. Ruby wasn't sure what to think. She'd had to read one or two of Jane Austen's works in school, but it had been so long ago. She wasn't sure she'd remember anything about them. You have all the traits of Anne Elliot from persuasion. So, the main guy on this show is going to be the personality of Anne's love interest? She bit her lip, trying to keep her breathing as even as possible. Meg shook her head. Usually, yes, that is the case. But the show will be a bigger test of the system. Two ladies from each of the six categories will participate, and at the end of the show, when the guy has chosen the girl, will reveal their characters. That's cool. 
Ruby's mind spun so fast with the information, those were the only words that came into focus. What do you think? Reality show? Cameras? Character traits? There was no way she'd survive. Numbers she could understand. Men, not so much. I don't think... Meg raised her hand and smiled. I know, girl. Believe me. I can understand some measure of anxiety when it comes to filming and cameras everywhere. But I've seen huge leaps from you these past two weeks especially. I think this would be great for you. It will push you out of your comfort zone and give you the opportunity to figure out what you can continue to work on. Ruby breathed out, staring at the back of a picture frame on Meg's desk. Was this like remedial English for dating? Meg must have seen Ruby's hesitation. If things don't work out in the end with the guy, I can set you up with the three guys I've matched you with, and you can date from there. Leaning forward, she took Ruby's hand. I think it would be good for you to at least try it out. Think of all the practice you'll have. Freezing, Ruby wished she could go back to a simpler time when her decisions didn't feel so monumental. She could just start with the three guys she was matched up with and pray the system worked. But heartbreak wasn't something she could live through twice. You want to date now? Since when? Since two minutes ago when Meg reassured her that there were people out there she could be matched up with, that she wasn't completely unmatchable. It took a minute to see the benefits of going the reality show route. Although they were few, the implications were better than staying in the same cycle, as if she were a hamster running in one of those plastic balls. How long will the show go for? She wasn't worried about her job, or money for that matter. With tax season over, most of her clients wouldn't start freaking out about taxes until at least January. She'd had a few clients who'd requested an extension, but as long as this didn't take the whole summer, she'd have enough time to take care of them. Meg looked at the computer screen and clicked a few times with the mouse on the desk. It looks like they have six weeks blocked off for it. Things change with this kind of show so it's possible it will go longer or shorter, depending on a variety of reasons. She turned and looked at Ruby with an impish grin. They won't be revealing the leading man until the day you arrive, so it should be exciting. Ruby sat back, wondering what to choose. Just thinking about cameras all around for six weeks caused heat to burn her cheeks but the promise of some help in her anxiety intrigued her. What would it be like to talk to people without fear of freezing up or stuttering? She made up her mind, probably the fastest she'd done so in quite some time. When do we start? Chapter 3 It was hard for Carson to hear much over the lunch rush at one of Sterling's favorite restaurants. Not that crowds bugged him, it was just having to shout, huh, every few words that started to annoy him. From the moment he agreed to do the show, it seemed like his life had gone into hyperspeed. He was more exhausted than he'd been even during hockey season. Okay, so you've taken the test required. Those will be used to pick girls who match up with you based on certain criteria. Sterling took a bite of his burger and chewed. Carson's stomach turned. This was supposed to be a publicity stunt, not an actual attempt to find love. It was all right when he was helping his friends, like when he'd helped Brennan surprise Lexi at his restaurant a few weeks ago. No one will know it's you until they start getting out of the limo. The show has put up posters everywhere of a guy in a suit with some question mark where the face should be. Sterling wiped his chin with a paper napkin, erasing the ketchup that had dripped. Carson picked up one of his fries, dipping it into the house sauce and taking a bite as he let that information sink in. That could be a good thing. I won't be attacked and asked questions if no one else knows beforehand, right? Where is this show supposed to be filmed? He pictured some swanky house on the outskirts of Boston and figured that could be good. 
he'd be able to hit the ice and wait room in between takes and dates. Sterling swallowed another bite as he picked up some fries and coated them with ketchup. The Berkshires. What? All the way out there? How am I supposed to train? The season starts in just under three months. I can't afford to slip up now. Nodding, Sterling said. The ice part I can't do much about. The weight training, I'll talk to the crew. There will be plenty of time to run and stay in shape without all the equipment. It's only for six weeks, and I'll make sure you have plenty of ice time once it's all over. Remember, you're going to have to make sacrifices to change your image. Carson groaned. It was either bend on his training or solidify his chance to stay in the city. Fine, I'll do it. Sterling's smile stretched to his ears. Awesome. They want to start filming at the beginning of the week. The sooner the better. Chapter 4 Carson, it's good to finally meet you in person. The man walking toward Carson was at least a head shorter. With a beard and rectangular glasses, he reminded Carson of a cartoon character. I'm Dan Strom, director of The Suitor. Are you ready to get started? Blowing out a breath, Carson said, As ready as I'll ever be. He tried to smile as he shook the man's hand. There were so many people milling in and out of trailers, it made him rethink his decision. This was no stunt. His thoughts sped up and he took a breath. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie... The words calmed him, just as they did to settle his nerves before every game. It had been something his father had taught him as a child, often while skating on a small frozen pond near their home. Dan smiled wide and pushed his glasses back on his nose. Great. Okay, let's show you around the property, and then we'll get the final few papers signed. Alicia, my assistant, had to run out for something in the next town. Unfortunately, everything we need you to sign is in the rental car she took, so we'll show you a few things while we wait. Where they stood now housed four white trailers, their fans humming loudly. Camera equipment was set up all over the grass, and a few men and women were setting them up, probably checking that they were in working order. Just follow me over here. Dan walked around the hedge with long strides forcing Carson to work to keep up. Once the cabin came into view, Carson stopped short. This is where we're filming? He pointed to the structure in front of him. The place had to be close to 5,000 square feet. The natural stain of the logs helping it stand out from the pine trees surrounding it. With a wraparound porch and large windows in front, he couldn't believe this was the place. It wasn't a mansion but it was definitely better than what he'd pictured. Dan nodded. Yeah, we're renting it out for the next six weeks. Let me show you inside. They walked through the front door, and Carson tilted his head back to look at the vaulted ceiling above. Two chandeliers hung from the ridge, antlers surrounding the lights on it. The fireplace was made of large rocks that stretched to the roof. A large, thick piece of wood hung as a mantle. The room was ornately decorated, and he could see the full view of the kitchen from where he stood. A large island with several stools placed around it, stainless steel appliances, and a large dining room table made up the space. This is awesome. It was all he could think of to say, and from the pleased look on Dan's face, he knew the man appreciated it. Dan pointed up and said, That's the loft. Up there are two rooms, so six of the girls will be up there. Raising an eyebrow, Carson asked, You're putting three women together in each room? He'd never had a sister, but there were some things he just knew by instinct. The fact that these women were going to be in close quarters while trying to win him over made him cringe. Drama did make for good ratings. There are bunk beds up there, and only one bathroom, though, so things could get interesting. It's the price we pay for secrecy, though. He walked under the loft and down a hall. There are three rooms here, but only two beds in each, 
The rest of the girls will be here. Crew will be rooming downstairs and in the trailers. Each of the rooms Carson had seen were themed, making the cabin feel even more rustic. What were the girls going to think of it all? He hoped they were a little more down-to-earth than the ones he'd seen on other shows. Otherwise, it was going to be a long six weeks. Where am I staying? He assumed the master bedroom, but Dan turned back to the kitchen. He walked right up to the large sliding glass doors and back. There is a small guest cabin just on the edge of the property, over in those trees. You'll be there. Hopefully it will give you some privacy, and you can relax a little in between takes. We've brought in a weight set and a few of the items your agent requested, so you can continue to train while you're up here. Turning to look at the director, Carson smiled wide. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Dan visibly relaxed, and Carson wondered why. Was it because of Carson's stature, or because of his reputation? It all started when he played in Chicago. A guy had said a few inappropriate things to the gal tending bar, and Carson had tried talking to him. The guy swung and missed, but Carson's fist connected with the man's jaw before he fell back, unconscious. The next day, Sterling had called, letting him know that the man had gone to the papers, saying Carson had struck him several times. From then on, he'd been labeled one of the bad boys of hockey. But that wasn't really him. He needed this chance to prove to the American public what kind of a guy he really was. I'm a Breeze fan, so I made sure to get you the best equipment we could haul up here. It's not a whole lot, but I would hate to think we didn't win the Stanley Cup this year when I could have done something about it. Carson chuckled. Thanks, Dan. I'm not the entire team, though, so it wouldn't be your fault. Better safe than sorry. I saw you play a few times in college. You could be the key to the cup. Dan gave him a look that said to leave the issue alone. Okay, let's head back outside and see if Alicia made it back. We've got a few things to get done before the women arrive. What time will that be? Carson looked down at his watch and saw it was only ten in the morning. Sterling made sure they arrived early enough to take care of all the little details before taping was supposed to start. They'll be coming at six? Dan turned to consult the clipboard in his hand and said, Yes, six. Introductions will probably take about 90 minutes, then we'll set up for the inside introductions and mingling later. He motioned for Carson to follow. The setup for tonight will take a bit longer than what people are used to seeing on TV. This show will be shown on the New England Network, but we will have a few cameras streaming to our YouTube channel. They walked outside and back to the trailers. Dan folded his arms and looked up at Carson. So people can see the entire process? Wouldn't that defeat the purpose of watching the show? Carson rubbed the back of his neck, a knot forming in the muscle near his shoulder blade. As amazing as the cabin was, he might not like it soon enough. There was sure to be some kind of drama, and with all he'd been through, he was ready for a break. The fact that people could see everything he did would make this the longest six weeks of his life. There is no sound for the streaming cameras, and they won't give anything away. I'm interested to see how that works. Carson stuffed his hands into his gym shorts, glancing over the cabin once more. He'd gone for comfort, seeing as how he'd have to wear a suit for most of the evening. Dan spoke again, and Carson had to turn to see him. So, women will arrive in the limo. You'll be here to greet them. He pointed to the end of the cobblestone walkway. After they all go in the house, you'll have some time to mingle with them. Ask them questions, get to know them as much as you can. We'll need the top four women you want to get to know after tonight's taping is over with. What will you do with those four? It just helps us prepare for future episodes. They will be the ones we give a little more attention to in interviews and such. Carson scrunched his nose. What about the ones who don't make the best first impression? Shouldn't we give them all a chance to get the jitters out? Nerves were already setting in, and it was still several hours before he would meet the women. That's not a done deal, but it just helps us in the production side. Dan waved to a car pulling up the road. 
Alicia is back. Let's get those papers signed, then you'll change over in your cabin before we do the pre-interview. The women will be here before you know it. Carson looked down the road that brought him here. Part of him was ready to run, sprint even, to the town a few miles away. The other part rooted his feet to the ground, knowing this would be painful, but the results would be worth it. Staying in Boston was his only wish, and if this ensured he wouldn't be traded at the end of next season, he'd do it. Chapter 5 Sitting in the back of a limousine, Ruby rubbed her hands together against the cold air barreling toward her from the air vents. Even with five other girls in the car, she slid her hands up and down her arms, the warmth coming and going as fast as her hands moved. She already missed the feel of her cell phone, something easy that could help her fill the awkward moments. The woman who took them away explained they didn't want any information to leave the set. Who would Ruby tell? Her parents wouldn't be interested. A little cold? The girl next to her asked. Ruby nodded, turning her eyes to the floor. She took in a deep breath, calming her insides. She was actually faring better than she'd expected, managing to avoid a panic attack she'd been sure would have taken over by now. She'd always been a little anxious, but it got worse every year as she preferred the quiet of home. The girls around her introduced themselves, small talk that Ruby tried to shut out as much as possible. The sound of the air decreased, and Ruby peered over to see the girl next to her, reaching for the temperature controls on the ceiling. Thank you, Ruby smiled at her. No problem. I'm Olivia Justice. The girl smiled, her straight white teeth flashing. Ruby Hunter. This whole thing is kind of crazy, right? Something about her face helped Ruby relax. I'm a hairdresser in Boston. What do you do? Biting the inside of her cheek, Ruby finally said, I'm an accountant. I own my own company and work out of my home in Carlisle. Olivia smiled wide. Carlisle is beautiful. I had a friend that lived in Concord, and we'd go through Carlisle sometimes. She paused a moment, long enough for Ruby to relax again. Are you excited? Nervous? Letting out a laugh, Ruby said, Nervous? Scared? Ready to run back home? A few of the other girls turned, and Ruby froze, unsure what they would say. One of them said, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Do any of you know who the suitor will be? All the heads shook, and the girl's words undid one of the knots in her stomach. The fact that these women could be nervous, dressed like they were ready for the runway, helped her ease into the seat back. Her breathing slowed, and she tried to smile, practicing some of Dr. Fausch's tips. He'll probably be gorgeous. They always are on these shows. The petite blonde girl brushed aside a few locks of hair, sipping on a water bottle. What are y'all's names? We should get to know one another since we'll be together for the next two months. I'm Chloe Barnes, originally from Texas. I've lived in Worcester for the past two years. The girl smiled and turned to her neighbor. Shayla Stevens, the girl with curly black hair said. From Rhode Island, I'm a fashion designer. The girl with short brown hair said, Cora Longburn, Beacon Hill. She examined her nails, a bored expression on her face. The last was a brunette with long hair. Ashley Park. My father's a divorce attorney, so I grew up in Chestnut Hill. Ruby stared at the girl, trying to figure out why she'd added the bit about her father's profession. Chestnut Hill was a nicer area of Boston, but she hoped location and occupation didn't matter too much during this show. Relax, just do the best you can and use this for practice. She probably wouldn't make it past the first week, what with all of these beautiful women sitting around her. The show had given them a dress to wear, 
but hair and makeup had been left to them. She'd been tempted to just pull her hair into a ponytail and be done, but she was glad she'd curled the ends at least. Ruby fluffed the bright green toll that made up the bottom of her dress. Olivia wore a soft pink one that fell to her knees, and Ruby wished the crew had given it to her. She loved that color, but with her auburn hair and pale complexion, it probably wouldn't have suited her. Olivia Justice, I'm a Boston girl, but I've lived a few places throughout the city. Her strawberry blonde hair had a tint of blue at the ends, and the way it caught the light was mesmerizing. She looked over at Ruby and smiled. Ruby Hunter, from Carlisle? Ruby introduced herself, and the others nodded politely. She breathed a sigh of relief until they started winding along the road. How much longer would it take to get there? The windows had a shroud on them, making it impossible to see out. Ruby had always struggled with car sickness and would need to see out to avoid throwing up all over Chloe sitting in front of her. Anxiety mixed with that wasn't the best idea when going to meet some guy she didn't know. Hopefully she could get control before she embarrassed herself. That was the last thing she needed. Pulling back the curtain a bit, she picked a point in the landscape and watched it for as long as she could see it taking in deep breaths and blowing them out slowly. A hand reached over and grabbed hers, prompting Ruby to turn toward Olivia. In a low voice, she whispered, Breathe, I'm right here, don't worry. Ruby breathed in, long and deep, feeling the tension against her lungs ease up. After a few minutes, she leaned over. Thank you, how did you know? That you were getting car sick? My younger sister gets that way when we drive. Do you want a bottle of water? Olivia leaned over to the shelf, stacked with bottles, and handed her one before Ruby had time to think about it. Accepting it with a small smile, she turned the lid and took a sip. The cool water soothed her throat and seemed to ground her once again. Thank you again. This is all kind of crazy, don't you think? Olivia let out a loud laugh, speaking in her normal voice. Yes, it is. I was telling my mom about it a few days ago, and she was torn between wanting me to win and thinking I was crazy for entering in the first place. A moment of pause took the smile from the girl's face, and Ruby barely heard. At least she'd had a good day. Ruby rested a hand on Olivia's, hoping to comfort her. Are you all part of the Love Austin program? Chloe asked, twisting a piece of blonde hair around her finger. All the girls nodded, and Ruby felt some comfort that they had at least one thing in common. Meg's words reminded her that while they came from the same program, the women were put into different categories. It made her wonder which characters the girls fell into. When that Austin lady gave me the choice to do this or meet the other guys, I figured, why not try for some hottie they've picked to be the suitor? Cora laughed, the sound fake and stopping short. Ruby grimaced. Guilt filled her as she tried to tamp down a surge of pride. But not everyone was perfect in social interactions, so she might just survive this adventure after all. Ashley smiled. Good luck with your chances then, girl, because I'll be winning this competition. Her tone came out as playful, but something in her eyes warned Ruby to be careful. Shayla clasped her hands in her lap, her chestnut skin popping against the pale blue of her satin dress. If you're so great, why'd you sign up for a matchmaking program in the first place? There was a pause as all eyes turned to see what Ashley would say. Because guys only date me to get a job interview with my dad or for my trust fund. I wanted to see if they could find someone less smarmy. She waved her arm around at the others and asked, What about all of you? Ruby was surprised by her answer, but that had to be the reason she'd mentioned her father's career. There was a hint of loneliness from the girl, a feeling Ruby knew well. Folding her arms, she listened as the girls spoke. 
Shayla said, I'm so busy with designing, it's hard to find a guy with all the crazy hours. I don't have time to waste on first dates with no commonalities. Honestly, I'm a bad judge of character. Chloe gave the group a bashful look. I'm really good at picking the bad boy and then have to recover when they break my heart. She teared up and Shayla handed her a tissue from the box by the bottles of water. Olivia nodded. I've got a lot going on at home. A friend gave me a gift certificate to try it out, and here I am. My parents gave me a gift certificate as well. They're worried I'll never get married because I'm so shy. Ruby opened her eyes, surprised she'd said anything at all. She was usually content to sit and listen rather than participate. Maybe she was making progress after all. Ashley gave her a sad smile. My parents worry about the same thing. My older sister is married with two kids already, and I'm what they affectionately call the late bloomer. That sparked several smaller discussions, and Ruby smiled at Ashley. She'd still need to keep her guard up with most of these girls, but they were more similar than she'd expected. Chapter 6 It had been over two hours since they'd entered the limo, and at some points along the drive, Ruby wondered if the vehicle would make it over the rocky terrain. The show should have picked a stretch Hummer. All the contestants would have fit in one trip with one of those. From the movement of the car and the little she'd been able to see out, they were going to the mountains. It had been a while since she'd made it out of her smaller town, but something about it made her smile. She'd prepared for the glitz of the city, but surrounded by trees would give her a chance to relax in between the activities the show required. Her home in Carlisle was surrounded with pine trees, and she often escaped into them. Olivia turned the air back up a bit, which helped the car sickness go away. She was grateful for the small act of kindness, especially when she felt her stomach in her throat. They stopped shortly after, and several of the girls pulled mirrors out of their bags. Reapplying makeup and adjusting hair, not sure she wanted any extra attention, Ruby sat back and breathed, hoping it wouldn't take forever to do the introductions. The window at the front slid down, revealing the driver. He'd introduced himself as Stan the Man when he'd picked them up in Boston, and Ruby still chuckled thinking about it. All right, ladies, I'll be taking care of you for the next several weeks, shuttling you to whatever dates and events you have with the leading guy. Are you ready to meet him? He grinned at them, and most of the girls cheered. Okay, you'll get out one at a time and chat with him for a minute before walking inside. Our lineup will go in this order, he said, looking down as if reading off a paper. Shayla Stevens, then Cora Longburn, Chloe Barnes third, Ashley Park, Olivia Justice, with Ruby Hunter last. Got it? Ruby's stomach nodded. Of course she was assigned to go last. The suspense was going to kill her if her nerves didn't. At least Olivia would be in the limo with her the longest, and it would give her time to get over the car sickness. Stan pointed to Shayla and then motioned for the rest of them to move. Go ahead and let Miss Shayla sit by the door on the right side. The rest of you squish back here in the seats so the cameras don't pick you up. Shifting and standing to move, the girls moved like puzzle pieces, slowly figuring out where to go and what order they'd be in. As if sensing they'd finished moving, the door opened and Stan held his hand out to Shayla. She looked back and winked before stepping out. Ruby sat on the opposite side clasping her hands around one knee and trying to keep her mind occupied. Waves of the ocean, sand between my toes, warm sun. Thinking of the beach had been the key to helping her calm down in nervous situations over the past several weeks. She'd tried it out at one of the classes she'd taken from Dr. Fausch, and it worked its magic once again, untangling the knots in her middle. If she could be calm enough for that first introduction, that was one more obstacle conquered. 
Once the door was shut, the girls on that side pulled at the edges of the curtains, doing their best to see what was going on. Ruby didn't feel like squeezing in there, and she figured she'd just rather see the suitor when she got out of the car. Olivia stayed next to her, her eyes glancing around the limo's interior. Oh, wow, he's gorgeous, Cora squealed. Shayla looks so small next to him. Why does he look familiar? Chloe turned away from the window, as if that would help her place him. Ashley made an approving sound, and Ruby closed her eyes. Let's just get this over with. At least 30 minutes later, Ruby was sure Bees had taken over her insides as it hummed with excitement and nerves. The door opened for the final time, and Stan reached toward her. She took his hand, staring at her feet to make sure they didn't trip on the way out. The man dropped her hand once she'd stood up, and she heard the door click behind her. The first thing she spotted were two cameramen, the red light on one transfixing her. She pulled her eyes away and glanced at the ground, taking a few steps to compose herself. Feeling a measure of courage, she lifted her eyes up to the man standing in front of her. Blonde hair trimmed short, clean-shaven, and shoulders that could rival the width of a river. As she studied his face, she walked with slower steps and stopped a few feet from him. Carson? He blinked and studied her face, his eyes opening wide as he said, Ruby? Oh, this is bad. So bad. Why? Why? His arms reached toward her almost mechanically. She stepped forward, giving the obligatory hug, trying to regain her breath. He smelled the same as she remembered, like the woods and cinnamon. She breathed in deep, losing herself in the memories that swarmed over her. You're on camera. Ruby stiffened and they stepped back. She gave him a shy smile. It's good to see you again. Yeah, I'm surprised you're here. His face had drained of color, and she wished the cameras weren't there, making her stiff as a board. Me too. She pointed to the path towards the house and said, Is that the door? Um, yeah, see you in there. Ruby gave him a little wave and wanted to die inside. Of all the people they could have picked to be the suitor, it had to be Carson, the one who got away. Chapter 7 Carson Couldn't Move How was this happening? He hadn't seen Ruby in eight years, and though he'd thought of her from time to time, or daily, he wasn't prepared for the onslaught of emotions to seize him. He'd loved her at 19, planned to marry her too. But things didn't always work out just how he wanted, which was one of the reasons he was here in the first place. She looked more beautiful than he remembered, with her auburn hair swept to the side, the ends curled. The bright green dress brought out her eyes and accentuated her slightly curvy form. But it was her lips that drew him in, the plump red color. He could almost remember the feel of them on his lips as he watched her walk into the house, all the emotions he'd gone through while dating her, and then after their breakup, washing over him in a flood. Cut! Someone yelled out. It took several moments for Carson to realize what was happening and to place the voice. What's going on? Do you know her? Dan asked, worry straining his voice. We checked into your love life over the past five years, but none of the girls on the show are women you've dated. Carson opened his mouth to respond, but found his brain still muddled from the whole encounter. We dated a long time ago. It's been eight years since I've seen her. That set off a frenzy amongst the people behind the cameras, but Carson didn't register any of it. He was trying to figure out how he felt about the whole thing. Eight years of wondering where he'd gone wrong and why she'd broken things off between them. And his body betrayed him when they hugged, 
a current of electricity traveling to his toes. He'd made peace with their breakup, and he was over her. Wasn't he? Sterling stood before him, snapping his fingers. Carson! What? He focused on his agent's face. We're going to take a break. The crew needs to meet and figure this all out. He let Sterling lead him around the side of the house, his mind still trying to process the words. When he stopped short, he asked, Wait, what do they need to figure out? Sterling frowned at him. What to do about that last girl? If you've dated, that isn't all that fair, is it? His insides churned. The last time he'd seen her, she'd given him back his ring. Tears in her eyes as she turned and walked back into her house. Fire ignited his insides at the memory. But seeing her now, the softness in her eyes, he didn't know how he felt. He could tell he hadn't completely forgiven her, but her sweet demeanor might not be able to take that rejection so early in the show. He'd always had the urge to protect her, and now, after all they'd been through, he just didn't want to see her hurt. Storming back to the small gathering, Carson pulled a man back so he could be part of the circle. Dan shook his head to some comment Carson hadn't heard. She's got to go. We can find another one. Leave her. Carson glared at Dan, causing the man to shift and push his glasses up higher on his nose. We can't. That's... Do the rules say that's not allowed? If the matchmaking company picked the participants, there has to be a reason she's here. She looked just as shocked as I am. One of the women in the group, Alicia, pulled out a thick stack of papers, flipping to the middle and skimming. After at least a minute, she stopped, her jaw working. There is no restriction on former girlfriends mentioned here. Then she stays, or I walk. But what about the other girls? They'll think it's not worth their time, like we set this whole thing up. Carson ran a hand through his hair. His mind spun, trying to come up with a good enough reason to keep her. If only she'd done that for him all those years ago. Unable to think of an excuse, he focused on the director instead of the others. Tell them or don't tell them. I don't care. I'll keep my distance from her. Why was he fighting so hard for her to stay? She was the one who'd broken up with him, breaking his heart. He lifted his hands to his sides as he went on. We can work around the other girls until we need to acknowledge her. I can send her home in the middle of the show or something. A thick silence descended over the group as the men and women looked to each other, trying to make a decision without words. Okay, you'll stay away from her until you hear from us. The director set his jaw and stared into the distance. We can spin this, I think. With a vigorous nod, Carson turned, walking straight into the front door of the house. He heard scrambling behind him as the crew worked to get a shot. His mind drifted back to Ruby, a deep chasm opening in his chest, like pulling at stitches. He pushed the emotions away, knowing his performance was critical to the show and to his career. He'd be able to act enough to get through this. Chapter 8 Ruby sat on one of the cushioned chairs in the large open space of the gathering room. She'd absently admired the inside of the cabin they were staying in, surprised to find tongue and groove walls and antler light fixtures instead of modern designs and crystal. She hadn't taken the time to look at the outside of the house, but she'd see it at some point probably on her way out of the show, since the suitor was her ex fiance There was no way she'd be allowed to stay longer than the next scene now. Her mind snapped back to the expression on Carson's face. What was she going to do? Her heart still thumped wildly in her chest, sending waves of panic through her body. He'd been just as surprised as she was, but his face hadn't shown her any of his true feelings. Did he hate her? 
Olivia's hand reached out, holding Ruby's leg down gently to keep it from bobbing up and down. What's up? Are you okay? Rolling her lips in, Ruby gave her a scared smile. It's just real now. More real than any other nightmare. Her new friend didn't look convinced and stared at her until a commotion came through the front door. Ruby recognized the director and several other people, their expressions trying to mask a sort of panic. The director locked eyes with her for several seconds, his face drawn. He then turned to a man in a black suit, whispering in his ear. Here we go. That was a short trip. At least I don't have to pack up. Hello, ladies. Taping for this shot will begin in three, two... The man in the suit walked out from the hallway and stood in front of them, his silver sideburns accentuating a few of the wrinkles near his eyes. Ruby was grateful she was in the back row as it was not in direct line of sight of his intense blue eyes. She interlocked her fingers, squeezing enough to keep from biting her nails. Good evening, ladies. It's a pleasure to be with you as we start this new series of The Suitor. I'm your host, Darren English, and we want to welcome you to the Berkshire's cabin. Let's get to know some of our ladies. He paused and stared at the screen for a few moments. One of the camera women came over and whispered, When he says your name, make sure to smile and wave for the camera. The woman slipped away just as fast and Darren said the name of the girl sitting to the right of the group. She smiled and waved, and the process continued down the front row. Ruby Hunter. The camera moved until it was only a foot or two away, the cameraman almost leaning over the girls in front to get the shot. She did her best to smile and wave, counting in her head to make it through the shot. What seemed like several minutes had to have been only seconds, and the camera pulled away, training on Olivia next to her. When they finished with all 12 introductions and a short break, Darren donned an over-the-top smile. Someone had given him an envelope during, and he held it up for all to see. For the duration of the show, we'll be adding challenges, which will help Carson see different sides of you. In this envelope is the first twist. He tore open the flap and pulled out a small pink card. The man hesitated, and it seemed every woman leaned forward in her chair, waiting for his words to spill out. He smiled and then stepped back. The card reads, One of the twelve women has dated our suitor in the past. Are you serious? That's an unfair advantage. One girl shouted out from Ruby's left side. Olivia leaned over. Well, it's obviously not her. She giggled softly, and Ruby tried to make some sound come out. But her throat constricted, barely letting any air in. She didn't need that kind of attention so soon. She sent up a little prayer that something would change the course of the conversation. Had Carson told them? It wasn't like they'd kept it secret when she saw him face to face. But, oh, this was such a mess. Quiet, Darren shouted, after sending a piercing whistle through the air. The room quieted within seconds. You are not to ask each other who it is, nor are you to interrogate anyone. Understood? His gaze sent daggers through the group, and Ruby was grateful for the stipulations. Her breathing came easier then, helping to keep her in her seat. Ashley cocked her head to the side. Why the rule against investigating? Ruby felt sorry for Darren right then, but the moment of worry passed and he smiled at her. I guess to see how you'll react with it. Besides, I have a second envelope with another announcement. The camera shifted and so did Darren, smiling at all the women. Before I open it, let's meet our leading man, starting forward for the Boston Breeze, Carson Carver. He pointed to the side, and Ruby held a hand against her stomach, hoping to calm the storm that raged within her.
Carson moved into view, and an audible sigh broke out among the ladies. As Ruby took him in from this distance, her heart threatened to run over to him right then and there. The thing keeping her rooted to the spot was the memory of his face when she told him she couldn't marry him. Pain and sadness overwhelmed her, not subsiding after all the years. She still felt like that young teenager, in love with the one boy who truly understood her. He wore a tailored gray suit, the cut of the jacket emphasizing the V-shape of his upper body. His arms might have been hidden underneath the sleeves, but he'd always been dedicated to his sport. Every muscle would be sculpted to maximize his skills on the ice. Standing there with one hand in a pocket, he looked like he'd just come off a model photo shoot. Bad boy. He's not the same guy you loved. As much as she'd tried to get him out of her mind, any time she saw articles about him, she couldn't help but read every word. The descriptions of him in the papers made him seem like a completely different man than the one she'd fallen in love with. That might be the only thing that would get her through this. The way his blonde hair swept to one side and his deep blue eyes gleamed, Ruby felt herself sigh along with the other twelve women. It had taken months for her to be somewhat normal after breaking up with him. Could she put herself through the small hope she would get to be with him, only to be crushed at the end? Carson smiled, making eye contact with the ladies one by one. When he got to her, she saw the smile falter a moment before a mask took over. She looked down, fidgeting with her fingers. There was no way he'd choose her, and now she'd have to watch as he flirted and dated other women. She just hoped she wouldn't still be around for when he made his final pick. Welcome, Carson. Why don't you tell us a little about yourself and what you want out of this show? Ruby looked up enough to see through her eyelashes, curious as to what would have brought him onto a show like this. Then again, he'd probably think the same thing about her. He took his free hand up to his neck and rubbed a red blush blossoming over his skin. That seems like a loaded question, Darren. He chuckled, and so did the rest of the room. Dropping his hand, he said, I'm Carson Carver from Concord, Massachusetts. I've been playing hockey since I was five, and I love my job. As far as what I want out of this show, he paused, a hesitant smile on his lips, his gaze moved back to Ruby for a few seconds before shifting to her right. I guess I want to get to know all of you and see if I can find someone willing to put up with me and my crazy schedule. The girls seemed to like that answer, and several of them raised their hands, waving and giving him coy smiles. When his lips turned up, brightening the rest of his face, she frowned. She didn't have a chance in Hades of making it through this competition. But the fact that he didn't say he wanted to settle down, or marry one of them, intrigued her. Welcome, Carson. Darren slapped him on the back. Maybe that girl is in this room. Carson grinned, revealing the slight dimple on the right cheek. How many times had he flashed her that smile? It still made her swoon maybe even more so now. Darren smiled, the bright white of his teeth, against the orangish tint of his skin, making him look more like an orangutan than a human. The suitor is sponsored by several generous companies from the Northeast. One of the companies is Love Austin, a matchmaking company ready to help you find the love of your life. Check out the web address at the bottom of your screen to learn more. Carson's mouth twitched, and Ruby wondered what he was thinking. At one time, she would have been able to read him as easily as the numbers on her clients' tax forms. But the years must have taught him to guard his feelings. The host continued, breaking up her thoughts. Each of the girls sitting here tonight has taken the personality test Love Austin uses for matching their clients and has been chosen based on a set of criteria. 
The owner of the company has given us three names out of the twelve women sitting with us tonight. Those names represent the women Carson would have been matched with if he just walked into their office and asked to be matched. Really? Carson looked at the host, his eyebrows cinched together. Darren smiled. Yes, sir, we have them in this envelope, and it is to remain sealed until the finale. The runners-up, if in the top three, will receive $25,000. If the name of the woman you pick is in this envelope, she will receive an extra $50,000 to do with whatever she wants. Hopefully, it will go towards a wedding, right, Carson? The older man elbowed Carson, and Ruby saw him cringe. Wedding and marriage might not be the best topics for him especially since she was sitting ten feet from him. Sure, Darren. Olivia leaned over and whispered, Is it me, or does he look uncomfortable? Shame burned through Ruby, and she gave a curt nod. Being here is a new experience for all of us. He'll loosen up. She hoped he would anyway. Even though she knew there was near zero chance she would be the winner of this thing, she hoped Carson would be able to find happiness after all they'd been through together. Darren spoke again, and Ruby cringed, wishing he would just leave and stop all the fake smiles and slaps on the back. It's cocktail hour. We'll let the suitor mingle with you ladies. And by the end of the night, we'll be down to eight ladies still in the running for Carson's heart. The ladies stood, walking through the kitchen and out to the back patio, where several tables were set up around a large blue pool. Her eyes shifted to take in the women around her, all beautiful, with different complexions and hair colors, different heights and styles. She didn't stand out more or less than any of the others. But with her history with Carson, she'd probably be in a limo on her way back to Carlisle tonight. Chapter 9 Carson did all he could to avoid staring in Ruby's direction. It seemed like there was a spotlight above her, and every time his eyes swept across the group of women, they stopped for a millisecond on her face. He caught her looking up every few times, but for the most part, her eyes were focused on her lap. Eight years, and still not much had changed. The same shy girl he'd fallen in love with all those years ago, and here they were, stuck in front of cameras, making it so he couldn't just rehash the past with her. Would she reject him, just as she had the time before? He didn't know if he could handle another heartbreak at the hands of Ruby Hunter. The crew ushered the ladies out of the house and by the pool. When Carson moved to follow, Dan grabbed his arm, pulling him to a stop. Let the crew set up outside. We'll get a few minutes of conversation with the ladies, and then we'll send you out. Sit down. Get a drink. He smiled at Dan, grateful for a few moments to prepare himself for what awaited him by the pool. Any man would be jumping at the chance to be surrounded by twelve beautiful women, and many would say that bad boy Carson Carver would be first in line, but they would be wrong. He could admit that his temper would get out of control more often than he wanted it to, but most of what the media shared was one moment after another, skewed to paint him as a bad boy. Over the years, he'd just stopped looking at the news. He was probably the only NHL player not to be on social media. Having canceled his accounts after the first incident, that's what Sterling was for to keep an eye out for him while letting him train for the game he loved, undisturbed. Several minutes later, Dan gave him the go signal. Carson stood, buttoning his suit coat and taking one deep breath in and out before walking toward the door. He pasted on a wide smile and prepared himself as if he were stepping on the ice before a game. Showtime. Hello, ladies. All the women turned to look at him at once, most of them smiling so wide he wondered if they would be able to move their lips when they stopped. One woman kept batting her lashes, and he wanted to ask her if she had something in her eye. 
I know it's been a long day for you all, with getting ready and then the drive up here. Let's make this time enjoyable and relaxed. He spoke to the three ladies nearest him, while the others milled about, as if waiting to prey upon him. It seemed as though that spotlight over Ruby had turned into a homing beacon, because part of him sensed where she was at all times. After 30 minutes and speaking with 10 ladies, he knew he had to speak to the last two. Ruby and the blonde-haired girl with her. He could fake five minutes for now, right? Remind me your names again, he asked, giving the other girl a smile. Olivia Justice, nice to meet you. The girl stuck her hand out, and he shook it, feeling a little more at ease, even with the cameras over his shoulder. He turned to Ruby and raised an eyebrow. Her eyes didn't meet his when she said, Ruby Hunter? She didn't reach out her hand, and he didn't force it. The less he touched her, the easier it would be to keep his heart intact. What do you both do, and what made you decide to come on the show? Olivia looked to Ruby to answer, but she was staring at her hands as they shook slightly. When Olivia spoke, Carson did his best to listen to her words, but everything seemed to be tuned in to the near-trembling girl with auburn hair. She'd always been shy and nervous to some degree, and eight years ago he would have gathered her up and held her close until the shaking subsided. But the iron will of hurt inside him rooted him to the spot as he nodded absent-mindedly at certain points of Olivia's monologue. When she finally finished, Carson turned to Ruby, and she looked up at him for the first time, their eyes locking. What is it you do, Miss Hunter? The amount of curiosity springing up in him caused him to bounce on his toes a moment. She'd had dreams when they were together, but he didn't know if she'd followed them through. I own my own accounting firm. It's nice because I'm the only employee and I can work in my pajamas on most days. She smiled, the first real one he'd seen from her. She'd always been good with numbers, and he smiled, trying to fake not having a past with her. Do you like it? I'm sorry, what? Confusion pulled her eyebrows together, a deep line dividing her forehead. Do you enjoy what you do? He folded his arms and trained his eyes on her face, searching for any sign of a lie. She gazed into his eyes for only a second before saying, I do. I'm good at it. Being good at something and liking it were two different things, but now was not the time to debate that. It was good to meet you both, he said, nodding to them. He walked back by the pool, waiting for the camera crew to get into place before he ended the night. Thank you, ladies, for allowing me to get to know you a little better. Let's move back inside and we'll announce those of you moving on after tonight. He hung back and waved to a few of the women who seemed to be making a last-ditch effort to grab his attention. This was exhausting. Would he make it through six whole weeks? Dan walked behind the cameraman and gave him a thumbs up. Well done out there, Carson. You showed enough interest in all to make this episode a wild card from the audience's point of view. Which girls will you be sending home? That was the real question. Nothing like making four girls cry all at the same time. Chapter 10 The alarm sounded early the next morning, and Ruby groaned. Grateful when Olivia turned it off after the third ring. With the post-interview they'd taped around midnight and trying to get unpacked and settled, she'd fallen right to sleep once her head hit the pillow. At least she'd taken the time to change out of her dress before that. Even with several hours of rest, her brain steered right back to the fact that Carson Carver was the suitor. The wounds her heart had slowly sewn back together over the years were open and raw again. Many of the nightmares from the night before were of everything that happened around their breakup and the succeeding months of heartbreak. She climbed down from the top queen-sized bunk, grabbing her toothbrush and face wash. 
Olivia was already in the ensuite bathroom, brushing her teeth. What a night, she said out of the side of her mouth. She grinned as she continued to brush, her mane of blonde curls everywhere. Ruby stepped up to the second sink and glanced in the mirror. Her appearance wasn't any better, with one side of her auburn hair matted to the side of her head. That's for sure. I thought my knees were going to buckle during the daisy ceremony. Ruby wished it was a lie, but she'd been nearly shaking as the cameras and host built up the suspense of the show. She'd been sure that her expression would give away her former relationship with Carson, and she'd be in a car on her way home right after. But she'd be staying until the next daisy ceremony. Darren had explained that instead of roses, like the traditional matchmaking shows, they would be giving out colored daisies. All of them were yellow last night, signifying a new friendship made. She'd cringed at such a dorky thing, but there were people out there probably dreaming about receiving their own daisy. Whatever worked for television, she supposed. There would be no Academy Awards for her performance, especially during her post-interview. Do we really have to get up this early? Shayla whined, her eyes barely open as she wet her toothbrush. She almost squeezed the toothpaste on the counter, but Ruby gently guided her hand over before the paste dripped. I'm afraid that we do, unless we want to take that long trip back to Boston. Olivia tapped her toothbrush on the sink and walked back into the bedroom. Ruby's stomach growled. It was earlier than her usual mornings at home, but with all the emotions she'd gone through in the past 15 hours, food was necessary. She took the stairs to the kitchen and almost turned around to hurry back up and change. At least half of the girls were up and dressed, hair and makeup done already. Several sipped from coffee mugs and gingerly ate pieces of fruit. They weren't scheduled to appear on camera for another two hours. First, breakfast, then beautification, or whatever the camera crew called it. Opening the cupboards, she was disappointed in the cereal selections, all brand cardboard. The fridge wasn't much better, with all the vegetables and fruits. She didn't mind those later in the day, but this early? What was she supposed to eat? She tried to watch her figure, but a good, sugary cereal was all she wanted right now. Something to shock the nerves that were already fried. On the very back shelf of the fridge, she found a small container of yogurt and pulled it out. That could work. Hey, Olivia said behind her. Ruby jumped, throwing the container in the air. Both girls reached for it, Ruby catching the yogurt before it exploded on the floor. Sorry, I thought you saw me coming. Ruby turned and smiled at her. Nope, I was trying to pull off this lid, and it doesn't want to budge. She took in Olivia's pajamas and was grateful she hadn't gotten ready yet either. At least she wasn't alone in her need to not be put together every minute of this competition. How did everyone sleep? Ashley asked, filing her nails on one of the stools at the bar. Murmurs of good and okay echoed around the room. Everyone went back to eating their breakfast or reading one of the few magazines allowed in the house. Olivia pulled open the cupboards. What? We don't get real food in this place? No marshmallow cereal goodness? She turned around, eyes flashing to every girl in the room. Cora shrugged her shoulders, not looking over from applying her makeup. That's all that was there when I got down here, but it's probably better so we don't gain weight. We need to get some real food in here. I'll be the crazy lady if I don't get something with flavor. She smiled wide at Ruby and sat down, pulling a banana from a bowl in the middle of the island. I never got a chance to ask you, how was your first meeting with Carson last night? Everything go okay? Ruby nodded, not meeting her eyes. Yeah. I was as awkward as ever, but it was good for me. She bit the side of her lip, wondering if she should divulge her secret to Olivia. As kind as she was, 
they'd just met. Who knew if Ruby would even make it through the first week? Trying to remember her manners, she asked, What about you? Any sparks? Olivia's face got a dreamy look to it as she stared at the ceiling. I don't know about Sparks, but he's definitely an attractive man, don't you think? I'm not one who believes in love at first sight, so I'll have to give it a few days and see how I feel about everything. Ruby wasn't sure a few days would fix her problems. If anything, it would cause her heart to crack and split wide open. If she hadn't been some easily swayed teenager, would she have still been married to him? It was something she'd be thinking about the whole time she was there. That morning was one of those days Carson was grateful he didn't have to function first thing. He was used to early morning workouts. But after a tough one the afternoon before, using the weight set and jump rope the crew had provided, he needed sleep. Soreness ached in muscles he hadn't felt in a long time. Deciding a run would be better to get him up and awake he threw on some shorts and a shirt. He could see a path leading from his small cabin into the trees behind. It would work. Anything to keep him from thinking about Ruby. Curiosity bubbled inside him. What was she doing? He remembered Ruby wasn't a huge fan of working out. But it had been eight years. Had that made a difference? Shaking off those thoughts, he went through the mental list of the other girls who'd made it through last night's flower ceremony. He didn't want to rely on the cards to remember names. If he was going to be stuck here, he might as well make it enjoyable for everyone. On his way back down the path, he veered to the right, getting as close to the house as he could, while the trees and bushes still hid him. Slowing to a walk, he saw two girls sitting around the pool, one with long, dark brown hair sat with her head back and sunglasses on. Ashley, from what he could remember. A short-haired brunette sat next to her, picking at her cuticles. The show didn't allow cell phones, TV, or internet, which made it interesting to see what the women did with their time. For him, it was always time to keep in shape. And with all the food he'd be eating in the next few days, he was sure he'd need it to stay on top of his game. He didn't want to throw up during his first workout a few weeks from now with Gunner, the trainer for the Boston Breeze. The man was hardcore, and he'd never let Carson live it down. Just as he was about to pull away from the trees, he saw a girl with curly blonde hair walk out of the house. He tried to remember who she was and realized she had sat by Ruby the night before and had been by her side at the pool. They seemed to be fast friends, something he was grateful for as much as he didn't want to admit it. Even though Ruby had crushed him all those years ago, he still didn't like to see her cry. Ruby and the other girl were dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, tennis shoes on, they moved to walk around the house when the girl with the sunglasses lifted her head. Thanks for going on a walk, girls. More time for me when Carson comes by, Ashley called, not moving more than her mouth. Good luck with that. Shayla said she was the last of us to do the post-interview last night, and he was set to be interviewed after her, at two in the morning. Poor guy probably needs a break from all this. I doubt it's the same as playing a game of professional hockey. The blonde girl, Olivia, his mind reminded him, made a face of satisfaction. She wasn't wrong. The hours for this gig were already wearing on him, and it had only been one night. The short-haired girl said, I'd still be sleeping at that rate. We're going for a walk. Would you like to join us? Ruby asked. Ashley moved her sunglasses down and looked at the girls. Nah, I don't want to lose the tan I've worked so hard on for the past few weeks. The two of you could use some sun. You're a little pasty. Come on, Ruby. I need to walk off my frustrations with the lack of edible options in our fridge at the moment before I do something drastic. Olivia took a few steps away from the pool. Ruby's eyes glanced back to the girl with the sunglasses a hint of a smile on her face. Sun causes skin aging, she threw out as she turned to follow Olivia. 
The tone sounded as though she was taunting the other girl. Carson couldn't pull his eyes away from her. The little bit of sass sent a chill through him. Maybe she'd gained more of it than he'd suspected. Pushing away from the trees, he walked back to the guesthouse unseen. Let the caddy games begin. Chapter 11 Ruby's face burned as she turned away from Ashley. She couldn't believe she'd just said that. She wasn't one to taunt people usually, but she'd already had enough of the girl's saltiness to last her the rest of this adventure. And something about Olivia made her feel safe, like the two of them could survive whatever this show dished out to them. After their walk around the house several times, chatting about their backgrounds, she and Olivia went upstairs and got ready. If she knew Carson, he'd pick an activity for this morning's group date that was out of their comfort zones, just to see how they'd react to the situation. But that would have been the old Carson. From everything she'd read in the papers, he'd changed quite a bit. Getting into fights and struggling with drinking? But from the interactions the night before, he still had that sweetness about him that she'd loved so long ago. What do you think we're in for? Shayla asked, staring into a mirror as she finished up applying her makeup. Ruby opened her mouth, ready to voice her suspicions. But as she remembered, she was the ex fiance and she didn't want it to be so obvious this soon in the competition. Olivia pulled out a nicer t-shirt. I'm going to say we're doing something active. He's an athlete, and I bet he'll want someone willing to try new things. Don't you think, Ruby? Shocked that she'd been pulled into the conversation that was echoing in her mind, Ruby nodded, focusing on the contents of her suitcase. What looked nice enough, but wouldn't be ruined by a day outdoors. As she met the others out by the pool in a simple blouse and blue jeans, she was surprised at how underdressed she felt. Many girls were dressed in skin-tight skirts, their tops not always covering everything below the neck. When she and Olivia wore sneakers, many wore heels with three inches or more of height. Eh, just send me home. Three matches sound really good right now. Are you trying to get sent home? Ashley looked at her, her expression dark. Ruby shrugged. What if he chooses a sport to play for this date? It will be hard to run in heels. Her voice was matter-of-fact, but inside she was singing. Maybe she needed Ashley to hang around more often because she'd never been able to state facts as well as she did in front of this girl. Every. Time. Every girl paused, surprised expressions signaling they believed her. The room erupted in panic, girls debating whether or not to go change, when a voice sounded in front of them. Good morning, ladies. Carson stood before them in khaki shorts and a bright red t-shirt, the material looking as though it had been painted on. Ruby wasn't sure where to look because everything about him was calling up those old feelings she'd tried to bury. For the second time since she'd arrived, she wondered what it would have been like had she never broken up with him. I hope you all slept well, Carson said with a smirk. His playful gaze as he looked around the room made her wonder what secret he was currently holding on to. Today is our first group date, and we'll be doing a cooking class out in the yard. They should be almost done setting things up for us. He pointed to the pine trees at the far end of the house, away from the driveway. When he flashed them all a smile, Ruby felt it move through her body. Just as he turned to go, she saw him look in her direction, his face unreadable. For several seconds, their eyes locked and all the old feelings rushed back like waves. Crashing on a beach, but with even more intensity this time, he broke away, striding in the direction he'd pointed moments before. And like that, the high she'd felt as he looked at her disappeared. She could feel the dull ache form in her chest. She was already in deeper than she should be. 
Carson stood by one of the folding tables the crew had set up for this activity. Six women stood in a line, waiting for instructions, while the other two came hopping up, trying to tie their shoes. He tried to hold back a smile as he thought about them trying to cook in the soft ground wearing high heels, which they'd been wearing when he first showed up. Ruby's eyes kept flashing in his mind, the green drawing him in through the small space between the other women. He hadn't been able to read her entire expression, nor see the rest of her, but her eyes were enough. They'd captivated him eight years ago, and he felt the same stirrings now that he'd felt then. He really needed to avoid her gaze. As each meeting happened, it was getting harder and harder to guard his heart from feeling anything for her. Okay, I have some aprons here for you all. Let's get these passed out. He tossed them out to the women, watching as some of them caught the roll of fabric with ease, while others fumbled or dropped it. The eight women stood, waiting on his every word. I grew up in the outdoors, going camping with my parents often. One of the best things about the outdoors is the cooking. Are you sure? Because restaurants are nice, too. Shayla said, with almost a straight face. The other women chuckled, and Carson joined in. I agree with you, Shayla. That's why I own the Top Shelf restaurant, he said laughing. But when you go camping, you don't want to just up and drive all the way back out of the woods. Dutch oven cooking can be a disaster if you don't do it right. So, we are going to learn how to make some recipes today. Pair up and I'll come through with the recipe you'll be assigned to make. The women turned to one another and began chatting. Carson raised his hand and whistled to get their attention again. Just a word of caution, read all the instructions. This is what we're all eating for lunch. He smiled as at least two of the women groaned. Each pair took up a spot behind a folding table of their own, as well as a Dutch oven pot. Pulling a box from the main table, he saw the ingredients were for making the main dish with chicken. He gave that to a petite blonde girl, Chloe, her name was, and her partner. They looked worried, but he gave them a smile, hoping to give them confidence. The next box was for the potatoes, and he delivered it to Shayla and her partner. The ingredients to make rolls went to Cora and Ashley. The last box was filled with everything to make the dessert. He picked it up and took it over to Ruby and Olivia, remembering the last time he'd been around a campfire with Ruby. She'd held her marshmallow too close to the fire, and the entire thing was consumed in flames. Her eyes had gone wide, and she panicked standing up and trying to wave the fire out while also waving the stick in the air. Instead, the marshmallow came loose and flew through the air, hitting a tree some ways off. It stuck there until they packed up and went home some three hours later. Shaking off the memory, he slid the box onto their table. You ladies get dessert. He locked eyes with Ruby and said, Peach Cobbler. The expression on her face flickered for a moment, but she was able to mask it, giving him a close-lipped smile. He didn't let his eyes linger on her long, because it was the first relaxed smile he'd seen from her. Two strides later, he stood in front of the group. Okay, ladies, let's get started. You have an hour and a half. Go. As he watched them take out the ingredients, he glanced in Ruby's direction again. He was here to repair his image, not injure his heart. Chapter 12 What do we need to do? Ruby asked as she leaned over Olivia's shoulder to read the recipe sitting on the table. Olivia's lips moved with no sound coming out, her pointer finger following the words on the page. Okay, so we have to light a fire? She set the recipe on the table, pulling her curls into a ponytail with a hair tie that had been around her wrist. Ruby remembered making Dutch oven meals a couple times with Carson, but the finer details were hazy. Racking her brain, she tried to remember everything he'd shown her. We've got the charcoal. We just need to burn it. Burn it? 
Olivia's eyebrows almost reached her hairline. Ruby laughed and patted her shoulder. I know, it sounds a little scary right now, but they have these big metal pans. She pointed to the large rings sitting next to the tables. A quick glance inside showed that all the grass and debris had been cleared out, leaving it ready for a fire. She reached under the table and pulled out a large bag of charcoal. We can put the briquettes in the ring and spray it with lighter fluid, she said, pulling the bottle out of the box. They've included a lighter as well. Should we try it? She wiggled her eyebrows and Olivia burst out laughing, causing the others to turn in their direction. This is the most excited I've seen you about anything here. Well, we've known each other about 12 hours. Ruby moved the pan to the ground and poured in some of the charcoal. I feel like I'm making progress with being so nervous. Who knows what will happen after a week of this reality show stuff? Or six weeks? Olivia winked at her. Ruby wanted to believe she'd be here till the end, but another part of her knew the probability of that was slim. As she thought of Carson in a relationship with any of the girls still left in the competition, she knew it would take a lot to bounce back from that kind of disappointment. I doubt I'll survive that long, but this is the most fun I've had in a while. She grinned at Olivia until she saw a camera focus in on them from behind. She focused on opening the package of charcoal and then placing them in the small metal ring. Dropping the bag back under the table, she saw a small metal cylinder, several sizes under the big ring she just placed the briquettes into. What's that? Olivia asked as Ruby pulled it out. I can't really remember the name of it. Charcoal charger or ch- Chimney, Carson said as he turned from the table in front of them. Ruby nodded, heat exploding through her face as she pointed to him. Yep, that's it. She did her best to avoid his gaze, knowing they still had a lot of work to pull off dessert for the group. Okay, so we need to put the briquettes in here instead. Ruby knelt back down by the big ring, moving the black pieces into the small cylinder. Olivia helped with the last few. Are you sure? I've never seen one of those. Ruby nodded. Grab some paper we can crumple up. Maybe a section of the charcoal bag? There wasn't much paper around besides that, and she needed something to start heating the coals. Olivia ripped the top section of the bag, forming it into a ball with her hands. Here you go, Master Chef. She giggled a bit, and Ruby chuckled. I wouldn't say that just yet. She took the ball and placed it into the middle of the ring using the lighter to start a small fire. Then she placed the chimney on top, watching as the smoke came out through the top. The two of them stood over it, watching as the outsides started to turn gray. How in the world did you know how to do that? I would have just sprayed it with that whole can of lighter fluid and hoped we didn't die. Olivia shook her head, waiting for an explanation from Ruby. With a quick shrug, Ruby turned back to the table. I had a good friend who enjoyed camping and showed me some tricks. She kept her head down, trying to focus on the recipe, but she glanced up, meeting Carson's eyes from several feet away. He looked as though he'd been listening to her conversation, and a small smile played at the corner of his lips. How long do we have to let these burn? Olivia asked, pointing to the chimney. Ruby glanced back down and thought through the next step. It will be a few minutes. We should start mixing the recipe. By the time these are ready, we can get it into the pan and cooking. I'd rather have more time than not enough. Good plan. Olivia stood to the side while Ruby pulled out several peaches. Taking out the knives included in the box, Ruby worked to peel the peaches. Olivia then sliced them into the pan and threw the pit into the box. Carson approached and Ruby concentrated on the fruit in her hands, not wanting to miss and slice a finger. How's it going over here, ladies? She could see him glance around. You've already got your briquettes going. 
Have either of you cooked in a Dutch oven before? Ruby looked up and raised an eyebrow. Of course, he knew she had. While she didn't want anyone else to know about their past, she wanted him to see that she still remembered their time together. Even the simple tasks of Dutch oven cooking. At that moment, the knife slipped, cutting into her thumb. It took a moment for her brain to register the stinging sensation, and when she looked down, deep red blood dripped onto one side of the peach. I, uh, well? All she could do was lift her thumb in the air, blood covering the wound. Her brain seemed a bit foggy, shock taking over. She'd never been good with the sight of blood, especially her own, and her stomach lurched as if ready to throw up. By the time she thought about putting pressure on it, Carson had wrapped a towel around the wound. He squeezed with just enough pressure to help slow the bleeding. He pulled her arm gently to walk around the table and next to him. Opening up the towel, the blood had been wiped away for a few seconds before a new line of it appeared. It doesn't look too deep. Let's get you over to the first aid kit. As they walked around the other tables, Ruby could feel the knot form in her throat. The gentle way he held her hand reminded her of the first time they'd held hands. They'd been in the basement of her home the night of Halloween. After a year of hanging out with the same group of friends in high school, they'd decided to make it official as boyfriend and girlfriend. As they sat next to each other on the couch, their hands inched together until they were touching. Near the end of the movie, Carson had interlaced his fingers with hers. Even now, excitement zoomed through her as she reflected on it. Are you all right? Carson asked, pulling her from her thoughts. Ruby looked up at him, those sea-blue eyes showing a hint of worry. Sorry, yeah, just trying to think of anything but the blood. She glanced away, knowing her heart was already pulling her back to the same emotions she'd had for him all those years ago. Once she gave in, things wouldn't go well, especially if she was eliminated early. The corners of his mouth turned up a fraction before resuming the solemn facade he'd shown her since the night before. Butterflies floated in her stomach, and she had to mentally chastise her body for betraying her determination to stay unaffected. Deeds, not words, she whispered. She hadn't meant for it to slip out, but so much of her mind was filled with the good times they'd shared. Everything up until that final week was crystal clear with happiness. Carson pulled up short. What did you say? Ruby saw a mix of anger and shock on his face, causing her to replay what she'd said. With a shrug, she said, Nothing. Um, where is the first aid kit? Deeds, not words. It was something they'd started saying when they were together. With Carson's parents gone around the time he graduated high school, he'd had plenty of people say they were willing to help out with certain things, but fail to follow through. Like helping him move everything out of his parents' home so he could sell it and move in with his older stepsister and her husband. Most of those people never followed through leaving Carson, Ruby, and a couple of his friends who'd spent nearly three days emptying the contents of his Concord home. After that experience, he'd made up his mind that his actions would always speak louder than his words from then on out. The fact that she'd use them just then threw him into a tailspin. If he were to judge her deeds from the last time they'd spoken, he'd conclude she never really loved him. He could still hear the rain falling around them, mixing with the tears streaking down her face as she handed him back his mother's ring, the one he'd proposed to her with only a few months before. She'd said she was sorry that it couldn't work out between them. If she had been really sorry, she would have checked in on him, made sure he was all right after breaking his heart into tiny pieces. He needed to focus and get her finger fixed so he could go back to the challenge. Being near her, smelling her floral perfume, and feeling the small zaps of electricity when he touched her skin was churning up his insides. 
He couldn't go back to where he'd been after she left, because he might not make it back out of that dark hole again. Sterling walked out of the cabin and waved. Hey, you two, what happened? His face went from smiling to eyes wide as he saw Carson holding Ruby's hand. Just, uh... I sliced my finger. Carson turned to Ruby, surprised she'd cut him off. The old Ruby would have waited for him to explain, as if she had some quota on the amount of words she could speak in a day. Sterling cringed. Okay, we got a nurse downstairs. He looked up at Carson. I can take her down if you want to get back to the bake-off. Feeling relieved, Carson let go of Ruby's arm and took a step back. His agent and ex fiance moved to the door, and just before they went in, Ruby looked back. Thank you for helping me with this, she said, motioning to her hand with her head. Her lips were soft. No problem. At least it wasn't a bad cut. He stuffed his hands into his pants pocket and moved back to the tables, knowing he needed to get to know the other girls on the show. That would be the only way to get Ruby from his thoughts until this was over. Chapter 13 Seven o'clock the next morning came around faster than Carson had thought possible. Their lunch the day before had been interesting, as the chicken was extra dry and the potatoes had burned on the bottom. The rolls turned out to be edible, but it was the dessert that tasted the best. Of course, that didn't help him avoid thinking about Ruby. He stared at the weight bench sitting in the front room of the guest house. He knew he should be lifting, but he was more tired than he wanted to admit. He'd been all wrong about this reality thing being easy and only a few hours a day. He'd have to put in extra time working out after the dates today if he had any energy left. His mind called up when Ruby had pulled out the charcoal chimney. He'd shown her how to use it on one of their day excursions so long ago. He still couldn't believe she'd remembered how to use it. And then, when she'd made eye contact with him, he couldn't see any of the nerves she'd had since the night before. It was like she wanted him to know that she remembered. A flicker of hope flared in his chest for a second. Could she still have feelings for him? As if in an attempt to protect him, his brain called up the scene in the rain again, the rejection feeling just as fresh as it had eight years before. He needed to focus on the show, and the big question was who he was going to eliminate this week. He'd had another few dates lined up before the flower ceremony, but Dan had requested two possibilities by the end of the day. Something about having adequate footage of the girls. Carson shook his head and stood to get dressed. It was junior hockey day, and he couldn't wait to see the kids. It was kind of a bonus to see how the girls reacted to it all. He'd created the Junior Breeze program when he'd arrived back in Boston the year before, and it was one of the highlights of his week throughout the summer. Every Wednesday, the two sheets of ice filled with kids from 3 up to 14, skating and working on drills. He loved watching the kids improve week after week and the smiles on their faces after they'd mastered a new skill. Carson threw some ingredients into the blender making sure to pulse it a few extra times. He poured his protein shake into a large mug and walked out the door. Oh, good. Carson, you're up, Sterling said, running a hand through his hair. Carson was surprised his agent was still hanging around the set. The usually crisp and polished appearance had disappeared, and the rumpled and tired look told volumes about how Sterling was faring with all that was going on around the cabin. Carson took a sip from the mug and smiled. I should be saying that to you. Tough night? Sterling rolled his eyes. I swear those girls never sleep. They were up talking for hours, rehashing everything that happened during the cook-off. I didn't realize the women really do analyze even the smallest details. They spent a lot of time speculating about who you used to date, too. Carson stiffened. They weren't supposed to do that. 
Who was it? Holding his hands out in front of him, Sterling said, It's not that big of a deal. The director just said they couldn't interrogate anyone. It was just harmless fun. They can't watch TV or be on their phones, so they need some kind of distraction. It took a few moments to realize that what Sterling said was true. With all the rules already in place on the show, they needed some kind of a diversion. Okay, but if they do anything to her, let me know. Sterling clapped him on the back and nodded. Will do. Now let's get you into the car and on your way for the date. You'll head out now. They walked toward the cabin, and Carson caught a glimpse of the women through the window in the kitchen. He still wasn't sure which ones to send home. Would sending Ruby home, or keeping her there, be best for her? Either way, he'd be hurting her, especially if he picked someone else. Before he walked into the house, he rubbed his hands over his face, wishing he could find a way around the whole thing. Chapter 14 Good morning, ladies. Today is another group date. All eight of you are invited to join me for a day of skating. Chloe read the letter they'd received from Carson, and the thought of skating sent a shiver down Ruby's spine. She hadn't been skating since, well, since she broke up with Carson. She ran up to throw on a hoodie, grateful she'd already been wearing jeans. Her hair was pulled back halfway, the other half falling over her shoulders. At least it would keep it out of her face as she tried to remember how to skate. Olivia followed her down the stairs, similarly attired. Have you skated before? She whispered. Ruby nodded, smiling at her. It's been a bit, though, so I'm not sure I'll be any good. Ha! Huh, I'm one of those who holds on to the rink walls the whole time. Olivia raised an eyebrow to emphasize the point. You'll be just fine. It's only a date, not the Olympics. Olivia turned to look at her, relief written across her face. When you put it like that, I think I'll survive. The two of them joined the other girls in the gathering room. Some of them were dressed a little more casually than they had been during the cook-off the day before. Carson arrived, looking amazing in a long-sleeved orange and blue jacket, the colors of his hockey team. It fit over his chest and seemed saran-wrapped to his abs. After a minute, her gaze moved back up to his face, her cheeks burning as she noticed his eyes were on her. She'd been caught. Are we ready to go, ladies? He asked with a smile. He motioned for them to follow him out the door. Ruby bringing up the rear. Staring at the back of Carson's head as he towered over the women, Ruby wished she could wrap her arms around his neck and feel his arms around her once more. Don't do this to yourself. She just needed to make it through this date and see where things stood. The next flower ceremony wasn't for several days, but staying on the show until then wasn't a guarantee. A slow panic set in. This was the first time she'd been worried about leaving. She looked down and saw she'd stopped walking. Carson stared at her, his face a mixture of confusion and curiosity. Practically lunging for the car door, she slipped in, taking an empty spot next to Olivia and the sliding window of the driver. The rest of the girls were squished into the seats nearest Carson. Are we going to the rink where you skate? Chloe asked, making her voice go up high at the end. He smiled. Yes, we're going to the rink where the Boston Breeze plays. I'm excited to show it to all of you. The ride back to town seemed longer than the drive to the cabin. Most of the women asked Carson all sorts of questions, some of their over-eagerness causing Ruby's anxiety to heighten. Ruby and Olivia chatted about things here and there, getting to know one another more. At points, they listened to Carson's answers about his life and his career. Whenever anyone mentioned his first year in the NHL, or anything around the time they dated, he sidestepped the topic completely, giving Ruby a vacant expression. Just another reminder that she had no hope of making it far enough in this competition to recapture his heart. 
At last, they arrived, and with so many emotions mixed in Ruby's stomach, she was sure she'd vomit on the sidewalk outside the limo. With Carson walking up ahead, Ashley and Cora on each side of him, Ruby was grateful for Olivia's steady hand, helping to propel her forward. They walked in through a lower door and around the corner, stopping at the window for rental equipment. All the women and Carson had to pause before walking up to the counter so the camera crew could get into position. She saw a pile of equipment with number 18 stamped all over it, Carson's number. Of course he'd be using his own equipment for this. The other girls rushed to get their skates, and it was finally Ruby's turn. She'd never felt so odd saying her shoe size before, knowing it was taped. When the woman behind the counter handed her a pair of figure skates, Ruby shook her head. She glanced out of the corner of her eye and saw Carson was busy talking to his agent. Can I get hockey skates, please? She said in a voice just above a whisper. Olivia looked over at her. Why hockey skates? Ruby leaned in, giving Olivia a funny look. She whispered, They're easier to skate on than figure skates. Really? Because I can use all the help I can get with that. Olivia turned and asked the woman to exchange hers for hockey skates as well. As they sat on the benches, tying their skates, Cora said, Why did you want to get those ugly things? Figure skates look so much better with my outfit. All eyes turned to Ruby, and she did her best to breathe, hoping her heart wouldn't gallop right out of her chest. She shrugged. I learned on hockey skates, so it's easier for me than the other ones. It was surprising how the truth made things easier. A smile crossed her lips as she remembered when Carson had taken her skating for the first time. She'd just given her shoe size, and he'd chirped in that she wanted the hockey skates. Why? she'd asked him. Just try them. You'll thank me later. He'd given her the signature dimple smile, and even now she could feel herself grinning. Olivia nudged her. What's got you all smiley? Carson came back, skates on with a helmet, hockey gloves, and a whistle. Perfect timing. Is everyone ready? he asked. She watched him look over their skates, and when he looked down at hers, his eyes went up, a smile playing on his lips. She had the urge to stand up and kiss him, but then she would probably want to crawl in a hole of embarrassment. A kiss on television wasn't the most romantic thing in the world. And then she'd be the bait in a sea of sharks with all the other women swimming around her. The lobby went quiet after a few minutes, and she looked around to see the kids out on the ice. Looking at Carson, she saw a mischievous grin on his face. I may have misled you all when I said we were just ice skating. There is a large youth hockey clinic going on today, and you are all going to help me. The kid from behind the counter wheeled out a large cart covered in helmets and hockey gloves. He pulled a rolling garbage can behind him, filled with hockey sticks of several sizes and curves. What do you mean? We're gonna wear those? Leanna scrunched her nose up as she pointed to the cart. Carson nodded. Yep, I won't get out any pads unless you think you need some. You'll just be skating around, encouraging the kids during their station. Sound good? Ruby smiled. She couldn't help it when she saw the excitement on his face. Besides, she'd always loved watching him with the kids. She just hoped her legs would remember what to do once they were skating. Pulling on a helmet and gloves, she grabbed a stick from the bucket and held it on the ground, measuring it to her chin. Too short. She swapped it out until she found one that worked. She looked over to the side, the girls still fiddling with their helmet straps or trying to put on the gloves. Her eyes turned to Carson, who was standing only inches from her, eyes wide. He leaned closer and whispered, I can't believe you remembered. When she frowned in confusion, he pointed to her stick. She bit her bottom lip, shrugging. It's hard to forget your teaching. She smiled at him, 
Elated that she hadn't stuttered or looked away from his deep sea blue eyes. Her chest was bound to explode with happiness as she saw his face soften. Her eyes flicked to his lips and she licked her own, feeling a heat wave take over her body. Mr. Carver, a voice came from the doors to the rink. We're ready for you. Great, thank you. Carson turned toward the group of women. Everyone ready? When they all nodded, he said, let's get out there. Carson led them through the door onto the ice. Little kids dressed in hockey gear and jerseys milled about the rink, some skating with confidence and others sticking close to the boards. The scene was loud, but Ruby found comfort in it. She'd practiced and played and watched enough hockey to make this feel like home. The first time she'd had that feeling in years. The guy who'd called to them had assembled the large group of hockey players to center ice, and from the looks of it, the kids ranged from four or five up to ten. Ruby caught the last few sentences after she stepped onto the ice, feeling the sharpness of the skates as she allowed herself to slowly glide over to the group. She could hear the other girls get on the ice, some of them more hesitantly than others. Hearing a thud, she looked back to see Chloe lying on her back. Ruby stopped, wondering if she'd need to help out, but Chloe sat up laughing. At least this would be an interesting experience for all of them. Turning her head, Ruby continued over to the huddle of hockey players. We're grateful for Carson Carver taking some time out to help us today. So if you have brothers or sisters in the older clinic, tell them they missed out on this great experience. The man looked to Carson, who skated forward a few feet, taking the spot of the man. He smiled, confidence oozing from him, and Ruby found herself leaning on her stick, staring. Carson waved and said, Hey everyone, I'm excited to hang out with you all today. It was camps like this that got me started with hockey. It's a lot of work and practice, but I hope you'll learn some things today that you can take throughout the upcoming season. He half-turned, gesturing to the girls who'd finally made it around Ruby. Most of them clung to each other as they swayed, trying not to fall to the ice. These are some of my friends coming to help us out. Most of them haven't played hockey before. He glanced at Ruby for a quick second, making her heart sore. But they are here to give you a little encouragement as we go through our stations. Like a cheerleader? A little boy said in front. Carson squatted down to look at the boy. Yes, they'll be your cheerleaders for today. The boy grinned, which looked adorable through his mask. Sending the kids to warm up around the rink, Carson gave instructions to the guy about the stations he wanted to run. They worked to get the equipment set up, bringing out the soft black pads to split the ice in three. Ruby skated over to Carson and asked, Do you need me to set out anything? I think we should be good for now. Which age group do you want to take? He looked at her, his eyes searching her face for more than an answer. She reminded herself to breathe. The younger kids would be fun, but I think some of the girls will need the slower-paced group. I'll go with the older one. Surprise flashed over his face, and she bit her lip again trying to stop the butterflies in her stomach from making her fly away. He gave a quick nod and said, Okay, they'll be starting in the station at the other end. He looked at her a few more moments before someone called out to him. Skating down the rink, she saw the girls in a big huddle. What did he say? Ruby couldn't tell if they were bugged she could somewhat skate, or if they were just scared of falling. She slid sideways, stopping a few feet in front of the girls and sending a spray of shaved ice in their direction. It's already cold. Are you trying to give us hypothermia? Cora asked, a deep frown on her face. Avoiding the accusation, Ruby said, There will be a bunch of groups, six total, I think. You can choose which group you want to help out. The coach had divided up the kids. Skates cut through the ice as they went to where they'd been assigned. Olivia, do you want to help me with the older kids? They're on the far side. 
The rest of you can pair up and choose which group you want to work with. Olivia took small steps and grabbed onto Ruby's hand the minute she reached her. Ruby skated backwards, pulling her along. That's it. Nice and easy. You're the one he dated before, aren't you? Olivia whispered, curiosity lighting her eyes. Ruby almost tripped as she tried to focus too much on skating. She didn't want to admit it, but Olivia had been so good to her, she could trust her with this secret. Yes, she finally said. We dated our senior year of high school and then for a year after. Wow, I feel like I just completed like a thousand-piece puzzle. Just don't say anything to anyone else, all right? I didn't know he would be the suitor when I signed up for this thing. They arrived at the group they would be helping. Olivia leaned over and whispered, Would you have decided not to come if you had known? Ruby thought about it for a moment. I'm not sure. I mean, we didn't end on the best of terms. But I think it's good for me to be here. Almost like closure. Right. Olivia flashed her a look like she wasn't believing anything Ruby said. If anything, being on the ice is helping you. You look so excited. Ruby only nodded as the coach told them about the station before moving on to the next group. Anxiety constricted her chest, but as she looked at the boys and the few girls in the group, she relaxed. Kids could be brutal, but for the most part, they just wanted to be heard, to have an adult connect with them, unlike most adults she knew. Hey guys, I'm Ruby and this is Olivia. I'm not sure how long your clinic is today, but let us hear your name so we'll know who to cheer for. They went through the names of the 12 kids in the group, and when trying to repeat them back, Ruby got all but one right. I'm sorry, Peter. Hopefully now I won't forget it. The whistle blew and the kids reacted, skating in and out of the cones. Ruby skated up and down to the side of them, calling out their names as they moved through the drill. One of the short boys tripped and fell, knocking down the cones on his way. Ruby skated over to him, helping him stand and then doing her best to put the cones back where they went. You'll be all right, Ollie. Let's try it one more time. She fixed the cones and helped him back to the front of the line, where he completed the drill with ease. Yes, that was awesome. She gave the boy a high five and smiled at Olivia, who was cheering as much as she could from the boards. Moving on to the next station, several of the black pads had been set out. The idea was to skate and be able to step over the pad and keep skating. She was glad she didn't have to do it, although she felt much more confident the more she skated around the ice. After moving through the final four stations, Carson called the group together. Okay, everyone, we're going to get you matched up to play a quick scrimmage before we call it a day. Chapter 15 Carson couldn't take his eyes off Ruby. Well, he had to here and there to instruct his group, but he glanced over at her often. He was surprised at the confidence she had as she skated along with the kids and the way she cheered for all of them. He'd cycled to the other groups, and while the girls did their best, it seemed they were either bored or more interested in talking to him than connecting with the kids. As the teams dispersed to scrimmage, he waved the girls in, and they made slow but steady progress. Ruby's back was to them, clapping for her team as they skated towards the goal. Ruby, he called, and when she turned around, he waved her over, trying to keep his expression neutral. With the tingle of electricity moving through him as she smiled, he wondered if it had been a good idea for him to keep her in the competition. But a vision passed over his eyes, as if this is what their future would have been like if they'd gotten married all those years ago. When he'd watched her measure her stick, he'd had to hold on to the wall nearby. After eight years, he figured she'd forgotten all about him and anything he'd ever taught her. But first with the charcoal chimney and then the stick, it just made it that much harder, knowing he could never have her. What if she rejected him again? 
and why put himself through the pain of a second heartbreak from the same woman. He'd probably never recover from it. He turned to the ladies around him and smiled. How was it? Good, most of them said, while a few made comments about how their backside hurt now. Thanks for coming to this, ladies. You can stay on the ice for a bit until the scrimmages are over, or you can head out and take off your skates. I'll get this wrapped up and we'll be ready to go. Four of the girls made slow progress over to the door to the lobby, while Ruby skated back to the side of the scrimmage, clapping and fist-pumping her team along. So different from the shy Ruby who'd showed up to the first taping a couple nights before. Trying to remember who was missing, he found Cora, inches away, staring up at him from her shorter frame. Hey, Cora, did you have fun skating? Of course, she said, giving him a playful slap on the chest. I took figure skating for a while as a teenager. Do you want to see my turns? Do I have to? She must not have skated for too long because it was almost an unspoken rule that hockey players and figure skaters didn't mesh well. They were always battling for ice time. The coach blew the whistle, and after a quick pep talk, they cheered. Carson skated to the door that led to the locker rooms, making sure to give each kid a fist bump on their way out. When the ice was cleared, he started picking up the black pads. Ruby skated close with the tower of cones that had been left on the other side of the rink. The pads went through the back door and onto a cart, a slow rhythm taking hold. But then he heard a voice behind him say, Carson, watch me! He paused and turned around, reluctantly watching as Cora skated backwards, building up momentum. She wasn't bad on the ice, but as she came around the curve, he watched her push off into the air. She tucked her arms in, but at the last second let them flail, sending the twist out of whack. He projected her fall in his mind and sped toward her on his skates. Just a few yards away, he watched as she fell, landing on her head. A light trickle of blood colored the ice, and it took several seconds before his paralyzed body registered the situation. Skating forward, he found Ruby kneeling down next to the girl, her hand pushed against the wound at the back of her head. I need a cloth or towel or something. Her voice was firm, steady, commanding even. The coach disappeared for a moment before coming back with two small towels, which she pressed to the wound. Looking up at Carson, she said, We need to dial 911. The sooner they can take a look at her... He heard the slight hesitation in her voice as she concentrated on the unconscious girl on the ice. Carson paused, still numb from the scene below. Then the adrenaline kicked in, and he skated over to the door, opening it and the one to the lobby. Looking at the girl behind the front desk, he shouted, We've got a head injury. Call the paramedics. He didn't wait for the girl to dial before skating back to where the two girls were on the ice. His heart thumped in his chest, a feeling of dread overtaking him. He heard a faint sound, recognizing it as sirens getting closer. Pulling out his phone, he shook his head. He could have dialed the emergency response team himself. But as he stared at Cora so still on the ice, guilt filled him that he could have prevented this. He'd seen plenty of guys get beat up on the ice during games, some even leaving unconscious. But this was no professional hockey game. It was a reality television show, and he just hoped she'd be okay. He dialed Stan. Hey, there's been an accident here. Will you come get the girls and take them to get something to eat? Sure thing, boss. I'm outside now. Carson hung up and turned to the two girls who hadn't left the ice, huddling together at the far end, their eyes wide with terror. Stan is outside now. Go change out of your skates and get something to eat. I'll get to you as soon as I can. Time seemed to slow down, but Ruby was a constant, holding firm to Cora's head. Chills went over him as he couldn't pull his eyes from the scene. Cora's eyelids stayed closed, her chest only barely rising and falling. The paramedics rushed in, strapped with gear, 
a board held between them. Carson scooted down by Cora's feet, trying to stay out of the way. Can you describe the accident? One of the paramedics asked. Carson opened his mouth, but found Ruby was already speaking. She skated backwards to get momentum for a twist. As she was in the air, her arms came out, sending her off balance. She came down and hit the ice, head first. Time of accident? Carson looked at the clock on the wall. How long had it been? Eight minutes ago. Thank you, we'll take it from here. Ruby scooted back and then stood, folding her arms over her chest. Carson stood and skated next to her. She gave him a worried look before resuming her gaze back to the girl on the ground. As much as he wanted to put his arms around her and cuddle her to him, he knew now was not the time for that. It took him a moment to realize a cameraman from the show was filming the scene, even coming onto the ice to get a shot. Stepping forward, Carson said, No, turn off the camera. She deserves some privacy after all this. The man looked as though he wanted to challenge Carson, but looked down at Cora again. The red light turned off, and he lifted the camera down from his shoulder. You'll tell the director this footage is not to be used in the show. I'll walk if it does. His teeth clamped together as if that one act would intimidate the man. I understand, man. I wasn't thinking about it like that, so I'll make sure it doesn't happen. Carson looked down to see the paramedics lifting Cora as she was strapped to the bodyboard. They walked out, conscious of their footsteps on the ice. Carson nudged Ruby and she followed, skating to the edge and walking out the door. The two of them scrambled to take off their skates, Carson slipping on his other shoe as Ruby jogged over to the door and out into the parking lot. Dropping his equipment off at the counter, he said, Will you make sure this gets to the Breeze locker room? He barely waited for the woman's response before he chased after Ruby. The heat of the outdoors caused his jacket to stick to his arms. A paramedic shut one door, and Carson arrived to hear Ruby ask, Can I go with her? No, I'll go, Carson said, a lump forming in his throat. The paramedic looked at him, his eyebrow cocked. It's my fault she's hurt. Let me go with her. The man waved him into the ambulance, and before the door was shut, Carson stuck his head out the door and looked at Ruby. Call Stan. He'll pick you up and take everyone back to the house. I'll send information as soon as I have it. I don't have a phone. Or his number. Carson considered that. I'll take care of it. The door swung shut, and he took a seat on the side of the stretcher, the dial tone sounding in his ear. Stan, I'm riding in the ambulance with Cora, and I need you to pick up Ruby at the rink. Will you alert Sterling and the production people? Sure, Mr. Carver. I'll turn around and pick her up. The siren turned on, and they were on their way. He looked at Cora's face, her complexion ashen. He hoped they could do something for her once they made it to the hospital. Chapter 16 the limo pulled up and Ruby slipped into the safety and privacy of the dark interior. The other girls were quiet, their expressions somber. After several minutes in the limo, Ruby hugged Chloe, who was sobbing next to her. Stroking her hair, she cooed. It will be okay. Cora will be okay. We have to pray she'll be fine. I can't get the image of her on the ice out of my head. Worry seeped into Ruby's stomach as she continued to hold Chloe. The window divider slid down, and Stan asked, Is there somewhere you ladies would like to eat? Who can eat at a time like this? Ashley said. Ruby gave her a sad smile. We should probably at least get a sandwich or something. It's a long ride and you can eat it later. Stan nodded. I know just the place. The divider slid back up, and the girls sat, lost in their thoughts. Ruby saw Shayla staring at her, her eyes narrowed. How did you know to do that? Do what? Ruby asked, her stomach clenching as she awaited the answer. Hold her head like that? The images of Cora on the ground, 
The blood oozing from her head made Ruby wince now that she was away from it. I took a bunch of classes in high school. I wanted to be a nurse originally. The crazy thing is, I can't stomach my own blood, but helping someone else isn't hard. It's good we have someone like you here. She was touched by Shayla's words, her sincerity. Ruby hoped everything would be all right with the girl. It was one thing to be in competition for one man, but it was another thing to care about the girls around her. She had a lot more in common with them than she'd originally thought. Hopefully, Carson doesn't have to stay there too long. All of this waiting with nothing to do is killing me. Ashley's words sounded off, like she was trying to force a brave face. Really? We don't even know Cora's condition and you're worried about the show? Ruby's mouth tasted like a sour lemon. She scrunched her nose, trying to understand the insensitivity. The girl shrank back to her seat. An adrenaline surged through Ruby at her sudden courage to speak up. She didn't regret her words, but she was surprised to find someone shy away from her, Ruby Hunter, one of the shyest people in Boston. The rest of the girls looked to her and smiled, as if grateful she'd said something. All the practice from Meg's classes seemed to be working. It was coming at a snail's pace, but at least there was progress. Once they arrived at the cabin, the producers and workers of the show shuttled the women into the living room where the cameras turned on, ready to interview them about what had happened. Ruby was grateful the other girls took the lead in storytelling, as the bravery she'd felt in the limo had withered in the lens of the camera. When it came to the part of the fall, Shayla praised Ruby, causing her face to grow hot. The rest of the room looked at her, some with admiration, and others, like Ashley, with disdain. The woman glared at Ruby, and with some odd courage that swelled inside her, Ruby stared back, keeping her face neutral. When Ashley finally broke her gaze away, Ruby sat back with a hint of a smile on her face. She was improving. Maybe throwing her into a crazy situation like this was good for conquering her shyness. After the group interview, Olivia gave Ruby a hug, holding her a long time. The contact brought a bit of energy to Ruby, as the whole event had left her with a desire to sleep for the next week. The after-effects of the adrenaline surge made her legs wobbly. Let's get you to bed. You deserve it after your heroics. She smiled at Ruby, and she couldn't disagree. Sleep was what she needed most. As they walked up the stairs, she realized Carson still hadn't come back. She could only hope that Cora would be okay and that Carson didn't blame himself for the accident. They'd made progress today, with him actually searching her out to talk while at the rink. But it was still too soon to tell if he could forget the past to rekindle their relationship. Chapter 17 Another car drove Carson back to the guest house, giving him time to think about the events of the day. Once the ambulance had arrived at the hospital, the medical team worked quickly to get Cora out and back into the emergency room. He wasn't allowed back there, so he'd sat in the waiting room for over an hour before her parents showed up. Her mother started sobbing the moment he told her what had happened, and her father's face turned to stone. Still early in the competition, Carson hadn't learned a ton about Cora, except for the small talk from mingling a few days earlier. Was she an only child? He knew the pain of losing his parents, but he couldn't imagine what it would be like for them worrying about their only child in the ICU. The doctor had come out shortly after, saying Cora was stable and had sustained a concussion. The blood had come from a sizable gash just above her ear most likely from striking the ice. Mr. and Mrs. Longhorn, I'm extremely sorry this happened. Is there anything I can do? Carson's hands waved in the air as he spoke, unsure of how to begin to apologize for what had happened. 
Yes, don't expect her back at that show. Cora's mother lashed out before sobbing into her husband's side. Mr. Longhorn put his arm around her, looking up at Carson with dark eyes. I think that would be best for all of us. Please release her from the show. His words were slow but direct, using his eyes to add extra meaning to them. I understand, sir. If there's anything I can do to make her feel comfortable, please let me know. He reached out his hand and wasn't sure if Cora's father would take it. Just as he was ready to drop his arm to his side, the man reached out and took it. A sad smile crossed the man's features. It's not your fault, but we are grateful you came here with her. Good luck next season. Once he left the hospital, he checked his phone, surprised by the number of messages from everyone trying to coordinate things for the show. Dan had called the car to pick him up at Mass General. The drive back was long, and Carson's stomach growled, reminding him he hadn't eaten since his protein drink that morning. Now, at almost eight at night, it sounded like the roar of a lion, only not as loud. He'd spent some of the time answering emails and checking on the news. Deciding who he'd keep after the next flower ceremony had, in a way, gotten easier because of Cora's withdrawal from the show. But the guilt aided him. He just had to make sure no one else got physically injured while taking part in the competition. Anything to get his mind off Cora's accident. He should have paid attention to her. Made sure she had more coordination on the ice before he turned his back. The car dropped him off near the trailers, and he dragged himself around the cabin and toward the guest house. There were a few lights on upstairs, and he glanced up, wondering how the women were doing. After such a long day with so many unknowns, he just hoped Cora would get better and they could put it behind them. The lingering thought he had once he changed and dropped into bed was of Ruby and her enthusiasm for helping the kids on the ice. A dull ache formed in his chest for lost memories that could have been. But he was older, wiser, now. He'd just have to protect his heart as much as possible. Chapter 18 This was it. Ruby was going home. She'd packed up her bags as all the women had been instructed and waited. The A-line skirt and simple blouse she decided to wear was modest but comfortable. She didn't want to be put on the tee once back in Boston and have to battle the distance in a tighter dress. Nor did she want to mimic the common style in the room. Sitting on a stool, she saw the red light click on the camera. Darren English took his place in front of it, his hands in his pants pocket, and an odd expression on his face. Good evening, ladies. As I'm sure you're all aware, Cora Longburn suffered a concussion yesterday at the hockey clinic and will be taking the next few days to recover. She will not be rejoining us here, but we hope you check on her when this is all over. He cleared his throat and turned his body, looking at a camera to his right. When he spoke again, it was with a completely different voice, more energetic. He was a terrible actor, especially when it came to empathy. Carson, why don't you join me up here? Darren gestured off camera and down the hall, where Ruby couldn't see. She'd seen him walking to his guest house the night before, and it had helped ease some of the concern about the unknown of Cora's condition. He wouldn't have come back had there been something life-threatening. Every time she'd closed her eyes, the image of Cora on the ice had caused her to jolt awake. Carson entered the main room, looking handsome in a gray suit, a navy blue button-up shirt paired with a pastel blue tie. She moved her eyes to his face, trying not to get lost in the lines of his body. The pit in her stomach grew, and she felt like it was pushing up into her lungs, making it hard to breathe. She probably wouldn't receive one of the beautiful pink daisies in the vase. Only six were there, meaning one other woman, besides Cora, was leaving tonight. 
Sadness washed over her as she looked at the only man she'd ever had feelings for, had always loved, and knew that even if she survived tonight, she didn't deserve him. Darren looked over to the vase. We have six pink daisies in this vase, Carson. Of the seven ladies sitting before you, you will have to send one home. Duh. Carson nodded and looked over the small group of women. Shayla and Ashley, will you please join me up here? The two girls stood, their heels clicking on the hardwood floor. Carson held two flowers in his hand. It was fun seeing you both on the ice yesterday, despite what happened with Cora. Hockey is an important part of my life, and to see you girls give it your all was amazing. He moved his hands out to give both of them the flower. Shayla, Ashley, will you accept this flower? Ashley nodded and reached up to kiss him on the cheek. Carson stiffened before leaning back to force a smile. He gave Shayla a hug and motioned for them to take their seats again. Chloe and Olivia, please come up. Ruby's nerves were like sparking wires up and down her body. She hoped that neither of the two would be kicked off just yet. When he gave them both flowers, she breathed a sigh of relief. Lyanna, Jessica, and Ruby, please come forward. He turned and pulled the two flowers from the vase, and Ruby watched as his fingers held them delicately. She blew out a breath, trying to steal herself from the heartbreak that was sure to hit her in a matter of seconds. You all did such an incredible job yesterday, and it was fun to see you interact with the kids. Carson's eyes stared into Ruby's, and she locked her knees, hoping she wouldn't fall to the ground under his gaze. Handing the pink flower to Lyanna, he said, Lyanna, will you accept this flower? She squealed and hugged him for longer than seemed appropriate, sending jealousy pulsing through Ruby. Calm down. It's not the end of the world. Yet. Holding the last pink flower, he looked down at it. This flower, the pink of it, means admiration. This flower is for the person who reacted without worry yesterday, who helped Cora until the paramedics came. Ruby's heart went into overdrive. The sound thundered in her ears like waves crashing around her. She did her best to listen to his deep, soothing voice, her heart leaping when he spoke her name. Ruby, will you accept this flower? He handed it to her, their fingers touching for several seconds. Yes. Suddenly her courage spiked again, and she stepped forward, lightly kissing his cheek. She stepped back, feeling like her lips were aflame. She gave him a quick smile before looking down at the flower and smelling it. He gestured for Lyanna and Ruby to take a seat while he gave Jessica a hug. Tears streamed down her face as she left the room. She'd be taken in a car back to the city, and Ruby breathed a sigh of relief that it wasn't her just yet. But that flicker of hope she'd felt the day before got a bit brighter as she stared at the flower. Congratulations, ladies. We have made it to the final six. Your next date is a one-on-one. -on -one. We'll pick at random to see who the lucky girl is. Darren picked up a bowl Ruby hadn't even noticed was sitting on the table next to the vase. We have all your names in here. If your name is picked, you need to be dressed and ready to go by seven tomorrow morning. You'll be going on a hike with our suitor, so make sure to dress appropriately. Darren held up the bowl and gestured to Carson to pull out a paper. After several seconds of swirling the papers around, he finally pulled one out. He opened it, and his eyes locked onto Ruby's. Is that a good or a bad thing? He'd shown so much emotion earlier that she thought she could read him more, but his face was a mask until he said, Ruby Hunter? He gave her a small smile and returned the paper to the bowl. She couldn't believe she'd made it through this round and that she was getting a one-on-one -on -one date with Carson? Would it be awkward? She just hoped they could pretend to start over and leave the past where it was. 
From their interactions the day before, she knew it was possible, and she just hoped it would give them enough time to talk. They'd just have to find a way to do so when the cameras weren't all around them. Chapter 19 When Ruby reached the top of the stairs, she felt like she'd floated up them. Sitting on the edge of her bed, she stared at the flower, trying to memorize everything he'd said. She knew it would hurt even more when he picked someone else to date or marry or whatever this competition promoted at the end. If only she could stop thinking about it and how she'd felt. Then again, he didn't look too pleased when he pulled her name out of the bowl. Olivia walked into the room. Girl, we need to talk. She must have seen the panicked look on Ruby's face because she said, Oh, you're fine. I didn't mean to worry you. What's up? Ruby tried to keep her eyes from the daisy, but they kept moving back and forth between the flower and her roommate. When she finally looked up at the girl in front of her, Olivia's face was split into a grin, her eyes wide as saucers. You still have feelings for him, don't you? It was more of a statement than a question. No, I mean, no. I messed up too many times to count, and there's no way I'll make it past this date. Did you see his face when he said my name? Olivia scoffed. Didn't you see the way he was looking at you as he gave you that flower? I think he still has feelings for you, too. Shaking her head, Ruby wanted to believe her, wanted to think that if she said something to him, or told him how much she still cared about him, that he'd come running back into her arms. But that was just a dream. She'd crashed the possibilities for a happily ever after as Ruby Carver eight years ago when she'd given him back the ring. Can I ask why you decided not to marry him? Olivia said, tracing the stitching on the quilt of the bed. Ruby sat back. They only said we dated. What makes you think we were going to get married? Olivia grinned. I don't know. Call it a hunch. We were so young. My dad and stepmom didn't think he was good enough, and I thought maybe we could start back up after things settled down a few months later. I'd go to college and he'd figure out where he'd be for hockey and then we'd pick up again. But he never called. Don't you think that because you broke it off, you should be the one to initiate things? See how it goes? Ruby laughed. Yeah. That's the first thing I want to do. I can barely talk to him about the weather, let alone say my heart beats for you. Besides, you're part of this competition too. I don't want things to be awkward or sad for anyone. Olivia looked at her as though she was going to send her to her room. Ruby, to me, Carson is a good man. A hot one. But I don't feel that pull like you do. I hope I can find someone like that, someone who loves me no matter how many times I mess up, because he definitely still feels something for you. I'm not sure to what extent, but maybe you should give him a sign or tell him how you feel or something. It sounds so easy when you say it like that. Ruby chuckled, and Olivia joined in. I'll have to figure out something. Otherwise, it will be a long, boring hike in silence. Chapter 20 Carson was up earlier than usual, and he'd used the time to get some lifting in. His mind kept buzzing about the one-on-one, -on -one, the fact that Ruby would be there. Emotions surged through him. In a lot of ways, she was the same Ruby he remembered dating and proposing to. In others, she was different, stronger, more sure of herself. A knock came at the door and Sterling walked in. Carson laughed. What are you doing up this early? Just making sure my favorite hockey player is staying in shape. Don't want to have people worried you are slacking. He slumped in a chair and rubbed his hands over his face. Funny. Carson did one more rep 
and set the dumbbell on the ground. You look like you're enjoying your time here. Why don't you just go home? I'm sure you'd get better sleep and be able to secure more endorsements or whatever it is you do for me. He laughed and ducked out of the way of a flying shoe Sterling had sent his way. Sterling shook his head. I told them I'd be on hand to make sure you stay in line, and this is about the only thing we have going on. Kind of like having all our eggs in one basket, at least until the public sees the real you through this. I'm that much of a rebel that I have to have you babysit me? Carson shook his head, striding over to pull a banana from the bunch on the counter. That's the perception we're trying to change with all this. Sterling swirled his hand in the air, as if to emphasize his point. Are you ready to go? They've got a hiking backpack for you to take along. One for Ruby, too. Carson looked confused. A whole hiking backpack for a one-day hike? That sounds pretty extreme. He placed his hands away apart, signaling the height of a hiking backpack. Oh, well, it's not that big. It's not packed with a tent or anything but it has one of those nice tubes that you can get water out of without having to take the backpack off. Sterling, how often have you actually gone hiking or anything outdoors? Carson gave him a glare, and Sterling wilted beneath it. Not much, to be honest. Sterling shot him an embarrassed smile before resuming his normal expression. A notification sounded from his phone, and after a few moments, he peered up at Carson. I actually have to head back into the city today, some new thing to work out for your contract, but I'll be back in a few days. Good things, I hope. Sterling smiled. I'm thinking they will be. Just make sure to keep up the good work here. Let the audience see who you really are. Carson changed his clothes, pulling on khaki shorts and a dark green t-shirt. He left the guest house with Sterling, walking over to the camera crew to grab his mic. Ruby came out a few minutes later, giving him a quick smile. Did you sleep well? She asked. He shook his head. Did you? No, it's been a crazy couple of days. Have they heard anything about Cora? She turned, clipping the mic box onto the back of her shorts, and Carson had to look away before he could stare at her legs. She'd always had great legs. Shaking his head, Dan came up, clipboard in hand. Okay, we'll need to get a shot of you getting backpacks on and heading out. He pulled out two GoPros and handed one to each of them. Get some good footage with these. The camera crew will be around and shooting as much as possible. But these will help us fill in the gaps. Are we just going on the trail next to the guest house? Carson turned to point to the trail he'd run on a few times now. Dan flipped some papers up and handed Carson a map of the area. It didn't look like the most accurate guide, but at least it was better than the unknown. Is there something specific we'll be hiking to? Ruby asked, looking over Carson's shoulder. He could smell her shampoo at that angle, a fresh strawberry scent. He moved his eyes to the director waiting for his answer while he tried to steel himself against the rising feelings for her. We're not quite sure, but there should be some good sights along the way. This is more about the two of you connecting than anything. Dan gave them a smile, and Carson tried not to frown. Connecting with Ruby was not something he wanted to do again. At least, that's what his brain was telling him but his heart kept reminding him of her heroics with Cora, causing his insides to twist. We're all set up, Dan, the woman behind the camera said. Dan turned back to Carson and Ruby. Okay, head out. We'll see you at sundown. Chapter 21 The first part of the trail wasn't bad a slowly inclining slope, and Ruby was able to breathe without trouble. As they continued to ascend in silence, she did her best to look at the rocks and roots in her path. She knew if she looked at Carson's incredible backside, she'd go face first into the ground, and she didn't need that to be all over TV. They made it to a flat section of the trail, and Carson paused, 
looking back at her. Do you need a rest or anything? Her lungs screamed for air, but her mind yelled that she'd have to talk to him if they stopped. Even though they tried to stay hidden, she could sense the cameras all around. She didn't want to tip off the world she was the idiot who dumped Carson right before his career took off. Just a minute or two would be nice. I need to catch my breath. He stopped near the shade of a tree and drank from the hose of the water pack. Ruby did the same, stopping several feet away and putting a hand on her hip, trying to look like this wasn't kicking her butt. What do you do for fun? His voice surprised her and she looked at him with wide eyes. Her brain scrambling for something to say. At first, she wondered if he was genuinely interested, but a few near-silent footfalls behind her made her realize it was an act. For fun, I avoid everything we used to do together, like the plague. I read a lot, go for walks around my neighborhood, swim at the local pool. He nodded, giving her a slight smile. A fake smile. She could play this game too. And you? What do you do when you're not working out, coaching junior league hockey, or playing in games? The question seemed to catch him off guard because he opened and shut his mouth several times without any words forming. The first genuine smile of the afternoon crossed his lips. You've got me pegged. I don't have much time outside of trainings to do much. Every so often, I go out with some teammates. Ruby chewed on that for a moment, surprised his life wasn't all glamour like she'd suspected. Being a professional athlete was always something people idolized. From their past relationship, she knew it took a lot of work and a lot of focus to get to and stay where he was. Carson turned and walked forward moving through brush and over rocks on the path. There were so many beautiful wildflowers, Ruby took to picking a few here and there as she walked, tying them together into a small crown. They talked in bits and pieces as they took breaks, but Ruby was sure this would make the most boring episode ever. Should she try and walk next to him, or just be satisfied with where they were? She hadn't been paying attention to the clouds, and a loud clap of thunder sounded overhead. Looking up, the sky was a dark gray, the clouds looking like they were ready to burst. Large droplets splattered on her arms and face. Carson looked as though he didn't notice, his head straight forward and his steps steady and sure. The raindrops pounded harder and harder as they crossed an older bridge, water flowing at a decent speed beneath it. Once she crossed it, she scanned upstream. Standing rooted to the spot, a large gush of water careened around one curve and headed in their direction, looking more like a raging river. The camera crew were walking across the bridge, their eyes focused on what they were filming instead of the world around them. The wave crashed into the bridge, and the sound of splintered wood echoed in the air. Before she could do anything, the water pulled the bridge from its spot and carried it down the widening river. The three cameramen called out, but the water swept them away so quickly they were out of sight by the time she made it to the bank. A hand grabbed her arm and pulled her back, just as the ground was breaking away. She felt her body move, and when it stopped, she was pressed up against Carson's chest, his heart beating as wildly as her own. You should be more careful, he said, his voice raised. Didn't you see the ground falling away? Ruby took a step back, shaking her head. The harshness of his tone made her pause, trying to decide what to do. Maybe he'd gotten so mad because it scared him. She could understand the worry, and after losing Cora to an injury and blaming himself for it, he wouldn't want any others. It wasn't that she was something special in his eyes. Did you know it was supposed to rain today? She asked, closing one eye to look up at him through the falling water. After a moment, she realized what a dumb question it had been. No, I didn't even think to ask. We've had such good weather. He looked at the river and then up the path they'd been walking, his jaw moving like he was trying to make a decision. 
Let's see if we can find some kind of shelter up ahead. We'll have to wait for the water to die down before we can cross back over. What about the camera crew? Ruby glanced again at where they disappeared. Carson shook his head. I'm not sure. I hope they'll be able to get to land somewhere down there and make it back to the cabin. Should we go? It was the first time he'd asked her anything sincerely since the ice rink. Yes, it was simple, but at least he hadn't barged ahead and expected her to follow. Ruby took a step, her sneakers sliding in the now muddy trail. Carson took her hand, pulling gently as he took a few strides forward. The feel of his hand against hers sent a jolt of electricity all the way to her heart. Focus, Ruby, we've got to find shelter before we turn into popsicles. For it being summer, she was surprised at how cold the droplets felt on her skin. She'd brought the one sweatshirt she'd packed and worn to the hockey clinic. To wear it now or wait until the rain had stopped was the question. She'd probably freeze without something dry later on, so she trudged on, making it up another incline before a few paths met them. They paused under a large tree, only a mist hitting her face. Are there any shelters or other cabins on that map? Ruby asked, pulling a large section of wet hair out of her face. She hoped there would be something close. The outdoors were fun, as long as she was prepared, and she was not prepared for this. Carson pulled out the paper Dan had given him. I don't see much. It looks like the main road that leads to our cabin continues on, almost parallel to where we've been hiking. Maybe one of these roads will take us to another cabin? Ruby tapped her finger against her mouth, surveying the area. With a path that continued straight, and one to the right and left, it was hard to tell which way they should go. She pointed to the map. What if we take this trail to the right? Maybe it will take us back towards the main road and we can flag someone down to help us. The smile on his face grew wide and he folded up the map. Let's try it. Chapter 22 Some part of Carson felt whole with Ruby, even though they were lost in the Berkshires. Holding her hand to bring her through the mud had brought back the flood of memories he'd suppressed for so long. But there were so many questions he needed an answer for, he just wasn't sure where to start. It's kind of nice not having the cameras around. Ruby's statement pulled him out of his thoughts. He glanced over at her, and then around them, nothing but silence and pine trees. You're right, it's peaceful. He continued forward, slowing down a bit so she was walking next to him. The rain had turned into a sprinkle, making it easier to hear one another. What have you been up to all these years? I take it you're not dating anyone. He hadn't meant for the words to come out so sharp. But she didn't react, something he was grateful for. Well, I decided to become an accountant instead of a nurse. Random, I know. I can handle a little bit of blood, but some of the clinicals we had to do? I just didn't think I could be around it all the time and be able to do my job. I set up my own accounting firm in my house, and it's nice because I can schedule meetings whenever. He caught a trace of bitterness. Or maybe it was loneliness in her words. You did a great job with Cora the other day, but you always were good with numbers. What about you? You've lived in a few different places for hockey, right? She bit her bottom lip, as if she'd given away too much information. Had she been checking up on him? The thought thrilled him and caused him to worry all at once. He thought of all the bad boy headlines he'd accidentally fostered over the years, and it made him cringe. Yeah, I started out in Michigan, which you already knew. They bumped me up to the NHL fairly quickly, and then I got traded to St. Louis, Detroit, and Pittsburgh. It was a dream come true when I got the news I was going back to Boston. I just hope I can make it last. That was the whole reason he was here. But why? His parents had passed on long ago. The only ties he still had in Boston were his aunt and uncle, and then Ruby, and he wasn't even sure she could count. What made you do this show? 
she asked, fixing her ponytail. Carson let out a loud laugh. This wasn't something he really wanted to talk about, especially with her. She might not judge him, but he didn't want to feel vulnerable around her again. Eight years still hadn't filled in all those wounds. Chewing on the side of his cheek, he said, Honestly, to help me stay in Boston. My agent said that if I show Bree's management that I'm not a troublemaker and worth keeping around, I'd get a contract extension. Are you a troublemaker? She asked, the corners of her mouth flickering up. Running both hands through his hair, Carson took a deep breath and said, No. I mean, I'm not the bad boy the papers and the media like to spin. I got in trouble one time just after, well, when I first got to the league. Then it seemed everyone took a picture of me in the wrong situations, painting me as this person who can't settle down and control his own life. But I've never let it get that out of hand. His words sounded pleading, and he studied Ruby's face, trying to detect some emotion. I saw a few of those headlines and wondered what the real story was behind them. She was focused on the path in front of them, her expression thoughtful. So this show is to help you stick around Boston? Is there a reason you want to? She gave him a serious look, as if on his answer hinged a thousand outcomes. He stopped short, the words rushing out of his mouth before his brain could catch up to stop him. Ruby, why did you run away? Why didn't you want to marry me? Sadness and regret rolled over her features, her green eyes glossy with tears. She closed her eyes, the droplets streaking down her face. He reached out a hand to wipe them away, but hesitated before doing so. Her cheeks warmed his fingers and she looked down, her body shaking with a sob. I, uh, I worried about being a hockey wife. What? Of all the things she could have said, that was not one he'd guessed would be on the list. Eight years of wondering and that had been her worry? She looked up at him through her dark lashes, biting her bottom lip for a moment. A friend told me what it would be like with you being in the minor league. You'd be traveling all over from September to March, hardly home for more than a day or so before you were back on the road. Carson thought back to the few months before he'd been pulled up to the NHL and nodded. He'd done a lot of traveling and a lot of crashing in hotel rooms. What would their life have been like as newlyweds? The Ruby from back then might not have been able to handle the long weeks alone, the phone call once a night. So you broke it off because of that? You didn't even come see me off to Minnesota. You were one of my best friends before we started dating, and then you just cut all ties? He could feel the heat and anger, the feelings built up over time now finding a release. You know my father? I didn't see it then, but over the years, I've noticed how judgmental and rude he is. He also said you'd probably find a girl in every city you traveled to and wouldn't stay loyal. Her hands were tightly clasped, white showing along the knuckles. From the little I read about you, I assumed it was true. Carson had to pause, tempering the fire that threatened to burst out. You believed him? even when you knew how I was head over heels in love with you? Ruby looked as though she might cry again. He has ways of being persuasive. I thought he was looking out for me, but that wasn't the case. She sniffed, and it helped him reflect on her words, trying to look at it from her perspective. The rain increased again, coming down in a steady rhythm. He looked down the road and saw something hidden behind the trees. Pointing, he asked, Is that a cabin? They walked a little faster, and by the time they made it to the small cabin, it was a relief to be on the front porch as the rain poured down. Carson tried the knob and wasn't surprised when it was locked. Do you have a bobby pin or two? Her eyes flew wide. You're going to break in? She pulled two bobby pins from underneath her ponytail, handing them over to Carson with a frown. Just for the night, until we can rest and dry out, we won't make any progress in the rain, 
and I doubt anyone can get to us with that bridge out. He'd only had to break into places a couple of times, usually his own apartment when he'd forgotten to bring the key with him. After a minute or two, the lock clicked. Opening the door, he motioned for Ruby to walk in. She rubbed her hands up and down over her bare arms. It's not much warmer in here than outside, is it? Glancing around the room, he found a fire stove in the corner with a small pile of wood next to it. Let me take care of that. Do you want to get out whatever they packed for our food? I'm hungry. She nodded and he moved off to take care of the fire. He used all the wood to get it started and glanced out one of the large windows to the yard behind. He could see a pile around the corner of the house, kept dry under the overhang. I'm going to get some more wood from the pile outside. I'll be back. He slipped out the door and walked along the wood planks, making up the decking. He paused a moment at the corner, taking in the beauty of the place. He'd never thought of buying a cabin as he spent so many months with hockey, but something like this, tucked away in the mountains, might be something that could be refreshing and rejuvenating. The opposite of the busy city where he lived. He thought of the woman inside. Ruby was still the same girl he'd known in many ways, but in others, it seemed she'd gained deeper layers to the already good and wholesome girl she'd been before. Was her confession enough to rekindle their romance? Or bring closure for him? The fire would need the wood soon to keep going, and he turned from the beautiful pine trees to the large pile of chopped wood at the other end of the porch. A step or two before he reached the stack, the wood gave way beneath him. His ankle caught and twisted, sending a shooting pain up into his calf. The small tug to release his leg only caused more damage as he fell down until his hip hit the planks. He wouldn't be able to pull out by himself. He reached his phone in his pocket, but it was useless up where they were. The service at the cabin was already spotty, but even higher into the woods, there was no chance. He didn't have Ruby's phone number anymore either, having scrubbed it from his memory a few months after their breakup when he knew things weren't going to work out. Ruby! Ruby! He called, hoping she could hear him inside. He paused, keeping his breath shallow, in the hopes that he'd hear her footsteps toward him. When he heard nothing, he did his best to push himself up a few inches. A piece of wood under the patio caught on his shorts, and since his leg filled the hole, he couldn't reach down and remove it. Glancing around, he looked for something that would make an adequate amount of noise so Ruby would hear him. If he stretched, he could reach the very edge of the window pane, allowing him at least one knuckle. He knocked as hard as he could from his position, but it sounded too soft for her to hear. Changing tactics, he slammed his other hand down on the wood planks. His ankle didn't feel bad at the moment, but that could have been because his hip, stuck in a small hole, was cutting off the circulation to it. After what seemed like an hour, but was probably only a few minutes, he heard the creak of an opening door. He slammed louder, feeling at least one sliver in his palm. He knew the moment Ruby found him because she gasped loudly and ran toward him. What happened? Are you okay? Carson pointed to the floor. Rotting wood. I didn't see it and slipped through. Think you can help me? Of course. She inspected the hole, trying to pull at pieces of wood to see if they'd come loose. Do you think anything is hurt? I know my ankle is twisted, but I can't feel any other injuries at the moment. He tried to push up again but stopped. His breathing labored. I think my shorts are caught on something, though. Ruby nodded, circling him as she inspected the situation. She'd always been great at that, always analyzed things and then moved in to solve the problem. He just wished she could do it a bit faster this time. She jumped off the deck, and Carson couldn't see where she disappeared to. There's an opening down here. I'll go underneath and see what's got you stuck. Within a minute, he heard her working below, a rip of fabric making him cringe. He hoped it wasn't too bad. He hadn't brought a change of clothes on this hike. 
After a few more movements, whatever was holding his leg taut gave way, and he was able to push himself up and away from the hole. Ruby appeared a moment later, her hair pulled out in sections. She jumped onto the wood planks and walked over to check on his ankle. Can you move it at all? Carson did as she asked and cringed, feeling the shooting pain race up his leg. She grimaced and looked at him. Does it feel like you broke it or just a bad twist? I think it's just sprained. Can you help me get inside? He looked at her, trying to decide if she would be able to support even a part of him. Their six-inch height difference would make it difficult anyway. But with her thin frame, he hoped he could make it inside without hurting her in the process. She held out her hand. He took it. The zap of electricity shooting up his wrist and into his forearm. After a giant step backward, she pulled, moving him an inch or two before he helped to push up, standing on one leg. The movement, coupled with the smell of her floral body spray as he draped his arm around her shoulders, increased his breathing, making him feel like it was coming out in a wheeze. He did his best to counter the weight on his good leg, trying not to lean too heavily on her. She wrapped an arm around his lower back and held his left hand with her right. They took a step forward, and when he leaned on her, she supported his weight, shaking slightly, but she stayed upright. The expression on her face was determined, and if the pain hadn't started to explode around his ankle and into his foot, he might have leaned over and kissed her. It was a slow process, and it took some time before they made it to the door. By the time they got inside, sweat poured down his face, and he collapsed onto the stiff couch, grateful for the break. Ruby's face was red in spots, and she placed her hands on her hips as she pulled in breaths, her chest rising and falling to meet the action. Let me get you some ice, she said, her voice airy. I hope they have some ibuprofen here or something to control the pain. She moved away from his line of sight, and he stared at the vaulted ceiling, trying to stabilize his own breathing. What a day. He'd started it a little frustrated that Ruby was the one he was supposed to take, and now he was grateful. He wasn't sure some of the other girls would have been so flexible or calm given their current circumstances. Okay, I found some Tylenol. She handed him a glass of water and placed two pills into his hand. Her fingers grazed his palm, sending off firecrackers beneath the skin. As he took the pills, she left and came back with a small bag of ice. Do you want this right on the area, or do you need a towel under it? Put it right on. My body is used to the ice-to-skin contact. I have to ice my shoulder after every game and practice. She placed the bag on his ankle shifting a throw pillow under his calf to raise the leg up an inch or two. This reminds me of the time we went rollerblading down by the common. A smile turned her lips upward, and Carson loved the look of it. I hurt my wrist that time, not my ankle. Still, we had to get some ice from a street vendor to help the swelling go down, even just a little bit. Her giggle was contagious, and Carson found himself chuckling. We had some good times, he said, sobering. With a nod, she said, that we did. She paused a second before saying, I miss them. His eyes went wide as he stared at her face, trying to decide if the last three words had actually escaped her mouth or if he'd imagined it. What did you say? She didn't look at him, but at her fingers intertwined in her lap. I miss those times. They were some of the greatest memories of my life. He wanted to ask if she missed him, but the stove crackled and he saw the fire had died down. We need to get some wood in there so the fire doesn't go out completely. Do you mind grabbing a few pieces from the woodpile? Just avoid the spot where I fell through. He grinned at her and she nodded, moving to the door. A few minutes later, she returned with a stack of cut wood She dropped them on the side of the stove and placed a piece inside it. Add another. We need to get the fire back to what it was to heat this place. She did as he instructed and shut the door, looking through the window. 
Will that work for a minute or two? She turned back to him, pointing. Carson nodded. Yeah, I think so. His stomach rumbled, and they both laughed. Hungry? Ruby asked, already walking toward the kitchen. When she returned, she handed him a sandwich, still wrapped in paper. She took a spot on the floor next to the couch, tucking her legs underneath her. The scene was so easy, he wished it could be like this always. But would this just be a repeat of what happened last time? He took a bite of the sandwich, hoping a full stomach would help clear his mind enough to figure it out. Chapter 23 They spent the next few hours talking, remembering the past and catching up on the new parts of their life. Carson had tried to call out with his phone, but there was no service from his spot on the couch. Ruby took it to the other rooms but gave him a sad smile when the words no service still showed at the top of the screen. When Carson dozed off, Ruby got up to look in the cupboards, hoping to find something to make them for dinner. There were boxes of mac and cheese, but without butter and milk, it wouldn't be the best choice. A few packages of ramen sat to the side of them. It was better than nothing, and all they needed was water. She turned on the faucet, grateful that water came pouring out. Then again, it was summer, and most people didn't need to worry about winterizing their cabins until fall. She filled a pot she'd found in a cupboard next to the stove and turned on the burner. What are you doing? Carson called from the couch. He was still lying down so she couldn't see his head. She walked over and leaned on the back of the couch, smiling at him. I'm preparing a wonderful dinner of... ramen. She giggled a bit, and Carson gave her a sleepy smile. Considering we are stranded here, I'd say we're lucky we can get that much. Ruby glanced down at his ankle and moved to grab the bag of water. She dumped it out and filled it with more ice. Here you go. How's the pain? Do you need some more medicine? My ankle is stiff, but I think I'll be okay for now. He put his hand down to adjust his position on the couch and winced. She watched as he pulled his hand up to his face, inspecting it. They don't have any pins or needles lying around, do they? He moved his hand toward her and she shifted on the cushion, taking his hand with hers to bring it closer to her face. Slivers? Ouch. Let me go see what I can find. A few minutes later, she returned with a small kit from one of the backpacks. The show had packed a first aid kit and a small sewing kit in their backpacks, and she was grateful for the preparedness. Taking a seat on the coffee table next to the sofa, she pulled his hand into her lap. The light from the fixture above wasn't super bright, so she had to lean over to see the small pieces. She did her best to be gentle, wincing every time he jumped. I'm sorry, she said, more times than she wanted to count. It took some time, but she was able to pull out eight slivers, the last being a large piece double the size of some of the others. It started to bleed, and she wrapped a bandage around it. Glancing over the rest of the hand, she brought his palm to her lips and kissed it. Her body froze after, realizing what she'd just done and it took a moment for her to look over at Carson. His eyes were on her, the old tenderness from their time together shining through. Maybe he hadn't changed all that much. His hand twisted, fingers grabbing her wrist, and he pulled her to him, their eyes locking as she was only a few inches away. Her heart thumped against her ribcage, adrenaline taking over her body. His hand slid behind her head and pulled her closer, their lips touching soft at first, as if rediscovering the feel of them. After a moment or two, he deepened the kiss, and Ruby's brain couldn't quite compute what was happening. Just as she relaxed into the kiss, she heard a hissing sound coming from the kitchen. She jerked back and ran to the kitchen, pulling the pot from the burner until the water settled down. She had to fill it with more water and put it back on the burner, allowing it to boil again before putting in the noodles. After, she walked over and sat on the coffee table. 
Carson grinned at her. Did you just let the pot boil over? She gave him a lopsided grin. Maybe. How's your hand? My lips are still on fire. Her eyes flashed to his lips and she had to pull away, walking back to check on the noodles. This had to be a dream. Carson's lips still tasted and felt just as good as they always had, if not better. It was like barreling back into the past and erasing all the time in between. Carson looked at his hand, cooling some of the heat that had surged to her face. It will be good now that you got all the slivers out of it. A hiss sounded again, and Ruby bounded back over to the stove, feeling embarrassed. So many emotions flowed through her, she wasn't sure what to do. Part of her hoped they'd be rescued right then so she could save herself from the awkwardness of her actions around Carson. The other part wanted to stay here and see what they could do to mend their former relationship. Another kiss wouldn't hurt either. Chapter 24 Carson woke early in the morning when the sun hadn't broken through the lines of the pine trees yet. He stretched, feeling the stiffness in his back from lying in the same position the day before. He turned, the throb in his ankle increasing. Ruby lay on the floor, her arms tucked under a pillow, a small blanket pulled over her. He saw she'd placed a blanket over him as well, causing his heart to warm as he stared at her peaceful form below. He was able to slide to the end of the couch, hop over to the sink on one leg, and fill a glass of water. The crisp liquid quenched his thirst, and he took large gulps, filling it once more. Setting his cup on the counter, he hobbled back over to the couch, but saw the backpacks lying to his right. Closing the space with a few jumps, he sat down, pulling one of the packs onto his lap. He hadn't had time to look through them before. There were several snacks, the water pack, and the first aid kit Ruby had used the night before. Pulling the other pack over, he found similar items, until he reached the bottom. His hand felt something rectangular. When he pulled it out, he pumped his fist in the air. No way! A rustle came from Ruby on the other side of the couch, and she popped her head up, her hair sticking out in every direction. Carson smiled at the sleepy look in her eyes as she yawned. What did you find? Carson held up the black object. A satellite phone. We just need to call someone's number. He sat back and thought for a moment. Sterling had gone back into town, so if he couldn't reach someone on the show, his agent would have to be the last resort. Pulling out his regular phone, Carson used it to find Dan's phone number pressing the buttons on the satellite phone and waiting for the call to connect. Carson? A hurried voice came through on the other line. Yeah, how did you know? Is this Dan? Oh, good. Yeah, this is Dan. We've had search parties out looking for you all morning. Two of the crew made it back to the cabin and said how you'd be across where the bridge swept out. Where are you now? The words tumbled out of his mouth so fast it took Carson a moment to process it all. What had happened to the third cameraman? Carson turned to Ruby and she gave him a look of concern. He gave her a thumbs up and then spoke. We went up the hill just past the bridge and then took the road going to the right. We figured if we could keep going, we'd make it to the main road sooner or later. With all the rainfall, we found a cabin along that road and figured we'd wait until better weather. There was a pause on the line, and Carson wondered if they'd been cut off. Okay, I just got word there is a search party close. Can you meet them? Dan asked. Uh, well, I sprained my ankle. I'd like to say I'll be tough and walk through it, but I'd prefer a doctor looks at it first. Silence. Carson stood and hopped over to the couch, sitting next to Ruby so she could hear better. We might be able to send a car in. I'm checking the maps now, and it looks like that is a drivable road, correct? Ruby stood and pointed to the door. Hold on, Ruby will go check. After a moment, she came back in, nodding. Carson put the phone back up to his ear. She said it's in good condition, 
Send someone up. They hung up the phone and Carson looked to Ruby. Too bad we didn't find this last night, he said, waving the phone a bit. We could have had a real meal. You don't consider ramen a real meal? Ruby asked, trying to look serious. The corners of her mouth gave it away, and they ended up laughing together. Let me get ice for your ankle one more time before they get here. I'll get things cleaned up so the people who own it don't think wild bears moved in. Or Goldilocks. The laughter between them was so refreshing, and it was almost like they hadn't been apart all this time. Almost. Chapter 25 The ride back to the cabin felt like minutes compared to the couple hours they'd spent walking the day before. After hiking away from it the entire day before, the car arrived in about an hour. It might have been faster had they not had to go over several rough spots of the path. The morning had gone quickly, and once the doctor on staff arrived with Stan, he'd checked Carson's injury for quite some time. Most of Carson's answers to the health questions the doctor asked were things she still remembered, and after a thorough search, he deemed the injury a severe sprain. Now armed with crutches from the supply trailer, a few of the guys from the production crew helped move him to the guest house. Ruby popped her head in after most of the people left. Is there anything I can get you? He shook his head, smiling. I think I'm good for now. You should go rest. I can't imagine you slept well on the floor last night. He had a point there. Okay, well, I'm here if you need anything. She let it hang, like an open-ended invitation for help and support. When he only nodded, her emotions clouded. They had kissed the night before, right? Did that mean to him what it meant to her? She waved and headed into the cabin, ready for a hot shower and a long nap. But it was going to be a while before she'd get either. The remaining girls swarmed her once she made it through the door. Are you all right? What happened? You look dreadful. Thank you, Ashley. She raised her arms to shrug, but they felt like lead bricks, as if once she felt safe, her body was taking measures to make sure she couldn't overdo it. We're good. Carson sprained his ankle, so he'll be on crutches for a few days, but... How did he do that? Shayla asked leaning in as if ready for all the bits of gossip. Well, he went to get firewood and the decking gave way. The doctor said he needs a few days off it to fully heal. Otherwise, it could linger through the hockey season. Ruby gave them all a half smile. Ashley folded her arms against her chest. Where was their decking in the middle of the woods? She narrowed her eyes at Ruby, and the question seemed to suck the air from Ruby's lungs. There was a lot of rain, so Carson picked a lock on one of the cabins off the road. The girls started talking loudly, but Ruby could hear several, That's not fair, comments in the group. So that's how this is going to be, huh? Ashley said. What are you talking about? Ruby sunk into a chair and rubbed her forehead. Nothing happened. We had ramen noodles for dinner, and all I did was change out his ice pack every hour or so. Not the most glamorous date in the world, ladies. Ashley's eyebrows cinched together. But you still got to spend all that time with him. They'd better give us an equal chance. Girls, leave her alone. Olivia's words floated to her from behind the other women. She's been through enough already. She pushed through Shayla and Chloe, bending over to give Ruby a hug. How are you doing? I just need a nap, Ruby said into her shoulder. Pulling back, Olivia grinned. A shower wouldn't hurt either. Ruby laughed, and a few of the other girls did too. I'm on my way there now. Ruby stood and walked over to the stairs, taking one step at a time. Each lift of her leg felt like she was trying to pull a rock behind her. She'd made it to the fourth or fifth stair when Dan came around the corner. 
Ms. Hunter, we need you in the interview room. Can I take a shower first? Ruby heard the pleading in her voice. Dan shook his head. We need to get a shot of you after your distress. It will make for a good episode. Yeah, that's the first thing I'm worrying about. Good ratings. She trudged to the small room on the main floor prepped for interviews. Darren English sat in a chair reading over some papers. Not the person she wanted to see at the moment. Taking a seat across from him, she stared, waiting for him to acknowledge she was there. The camera moved an inch, and she saw a man behind it reach forward and tap Darren on the shoulder. Ms. Hunter, tell us about what happened on the mountain. He flashed her his signature exaggerated smile, getting right to business as usual. Everything flew through her mind as if at warp speed, and she wasn't really in the mood to rehash it all again. A rainstorm came on us. It dumped so much water that the river took out the bridge, along with the three cameramen behind us. We walked a bit longer and found a cabin where we took shelter for the night. She wasn't sure if she should be sane. They'd snuck into a cabin, but she was willing to pay for any damages done to it. So, you had time to get cozy with our suitor. Can you give me any details about that? Darren's face turned into a sneer, and Ruby's irritation deepened, heat rising in her throat. She put her hands out and said, Nothing happened between us. He got hurt going out to get wood for the fire stove, and I helped change out the ice on his ankle. Nearly 24 hours together, and you didn't kiss? Not even a little peck? Ruby stood, not giving Darren another look, as she hurried down the hall and up the stairs. Her kiss with Carson wasn't on camera, and she wanted to keep it that way. Chapter 26 Carson shifted in bed, grateful to be in a somewhat familiar place and not on a stiff couch. A knock came at the door, and he answered lazily, Come in. Dan walked through and stood at the foot of the bed. How are you feeling? Doing all right. I just need a little more rest today and I'll be back for filming tomorrow. Carson hoped the man would agree. His body was exhausted and he knew to be in front of a camera again, he'd need some energy. I think we can do that, but... But what? Searching Dan's face, Carson noticed a frown. What's wrong? Tell the cabin owners I'll pay to have their deck fixed, and we can cover anything else that may have been damaged, although we didn't use too much. Dan shook his head. It's not that. The other girls are angry. They're calling for one-on-one -on -one time for the rest of them since Ruby stayed with you overnight. Carson sat up, rolling his eyes. Nothing happened between us. I mean, we kissed once, but that's as far as it went. Well, Dan started, studying Carson's face. We need to level up the fairness. I don't have the time or budget to do overnight stays with the other five girls. Just stay away from Ruby for a bit until things settle down. We don't need chaos because the girls think it's rigged. Although that would make for a great episode. It's fine. I'll focus on the other girls. What do I need to prepare myself for tomorrow? Carson winced as he shifted again, a throbbing pain pulsing in his ankle. Don't worry about that just yet. Take your day to rest. You're going to need it. Dan gave him a sad smile as he left the guest house. What did I get myself into? Sliding back on the bed, Carson stared at the wall in front of him. If he'd known all this was going to happen, would he have come? As he thought about that kiss with Ruby one more time, he nodded. It was worth it. The next few days passed slowly, and cabin fever set in for Ruby as Carson took out each of the girls for their solo dates. She understood that things needed to be as fair as possible, but her attachment was growing, and with that, the chances of heartbreak as well. Ruby got up early to go for a swim 
hoping to clear her mind of all the feelings she'd gone through in the past few days. But even after several laps, she wanted to scream her frustration. She'd barely seen or spoken to Carson since they'd returned, and one part of her justified it to his limited mobility. But the nagging side of her told her something was off. After changing, she curled up with a book, determined to lose herself in a world far, far away from the reality that was wrecking havoc on her body. She was grateful whoever owned the cabin didn't keep any romance books, the sweet kind she usually liked to read. She felt like she was living in one at the moment and couldn't bear to read the end, especially if it didn't turn out how she wanted it to. Later in the afternoon, Olivia came into the room. Hey, how long have you been in here? Ruby turned the book to the side, showing her the spot she was at halfway through the book. Most of the day. I think I'm still beat from hiking the other day. Or you're hiding. Spill. Olivia sat on the edge of Ruby's bed, giving her a big grin. Ruby closed her eyes, her mind still torn between the fantasy world in her book and the real world of Carson. I just didn't want to see the girls coming back from dates all googly-eyed. I just can't. She let the words trail off, a stabbing pain hitting her chest. What was wrong with her? Olivia reached out and held her hand. You haven't really given me details about what happened at the cabin. Did you talk about the past? Did you make any progress to closure? We kissed. With a squeal, Olivia jumped up and down. Yes! Oh, I'm so glad. How was it? Her mischievous grin made Ruby laugh. It was good. So good. It was short because I'm awesome and the water for the ramen boiled over. But I had all the tingles in my lips and down my spine and... I liked it. She gave Olivia a half-smile and sighed. Everything she'd just said sounded like her 19-year-old self. Okay, so why stay up here hiding? I haven't heard any of the other girls claiming he kissed them. Ruby threw her head back onto her pillow. I don't know where we stand, to be honest. I told him how I worried about being a hockey wife with him being gone was one of the reasons I broke up with him, and it felt like we came back here in a good place. But I thought I would have seen him for at least a minute by now. A note works, too. She buried her face in her hands. Olivia pulled back one of Ruby's hands and said, Well, I just got back from hanging out with him, and I have to say, he's definitely a fun guy. I hope he picks you. That would be the perfect ending to your love story. Like all those second-chance romances, maybe you could write your story one day. Ha ha, funny. I'm an accountant, not a writer. As amazing as that sounds, I have to wait and see what happens at the end of this, you know? With a pat to her hand, Olivia said, I know. Come down and get some food with me. Maybe we can play a game of pool or find something else to do. It's too hot to go outside just yet. Sighing again, Ruby marked her place in the book. Let me change really quick. I don't need the girls thinking I don't ever dress up. Are you kidding? I was thinking about changing into something comfy myself. Then I don't feel bad hanging around the cabin and not going outside. Olivia grabbed a pair of athletic shorts from her drawer and threw on a t-shirt, helping Ruby feel comfortable in her similar attire. Thank you. Ruby said as they walked down the stairs. Olivia turned to look at her, confused. For what? For being real and being a friend. They smiled at one another and moved into the kitchen. Shayla and Chloe stood around watching as Lyanna prepared something on the stove. From the smell of it, it was not ramen noodles. Lyanna looked up at them and said, Hey, I'm making chicken fajitas if you two want some. I think Ashley got the evening date, so they'll probably be doing dinner together anyway. Ruby took a carrot from a veggie tray and dipped it into the ranch sauce. That sounds amazing. It smells even better. 
They stood around in silence for a while before Chloe turned to Shayla. What did you do on your date? It was this morning, so the crew had set up a little breakfast burrito bar outside. We sat by the pool and talked. It's hard that he can't do a whole lot of active things just yet. Maybe if I stick around for the next round, he'll be well enough to do something exciting. Olivia asked, What do you think of as something exciting? Ruby had wondered the same thing and gave her friend a smile. You know, all those reality bachelor shows? They go parasailing or fly around in a balloon, take trips to Hawaii or Paris. I don't think this show has quite that much funding, Ruby said, taking another bite of carrot. Shayla frowned at her and turned to face Olivia. What about you, Olivia? What did you do? She smiled and shrugged. We had lunch and then hung out over on the little place that they have on the property. Chloe's eyebrows rose. You mean you sat on the swings for a date? How lame is that? I thought it was fun. Simple and fun is all I need. Besides, we're supposed to be getting to know him, and the best way to do that is through talking. You can't know if you connect with someone if you don't know anything about them. Olivia turned and Ruby nodded in agreement. Girl, I don't need any words to see if there's a connection. All I need is lip-to-lip contact. The girls laughed at Shayla's comment, but Ruby froze. She wanted to ask a follow-up question, but her tongue seemed stuck to the bottom of her mouth all of a sudden. She was grateful when Chloe asked, Have you kissed Carson? Shayla wiggled her eyes and gave them a demure smile causing Ruby's stomach to sour. Chloe then said, We kissed on our date last night. Fury erupted in Ruby's chest, something she hadn't felt in a long time, maybe ever. Lyanna brought the pan of chicken fajitas to the counter, setting it next to tortillas and a bunch of toppings. As the others prepared their tortillas, she sat, staring off into space, Is that what the kiss between her and Carson had been? Just a big experiment in connection? Hers hadn't been filmed. Did that make any difference in the fact that he was kissing all the girls left on the show? Ruby's emotions sent her stomach roaring. When she was angry, she ate. Now, with two fajitas on her plate and a pile of tortilla chips with salsa, she took the last seat facing the window. So, Chloe, you and Carson kissed. How was it on a scale of five? Best kiss of your life, or please don't make me kiss him again? Shayla giggled, and Ruby wondered if she was drunk or just needed some sleep. Can I use a fraction? I'd say 4.75. He was awesome, but my ex-boyfriend back in Texas? That guy can kiss. It's like a knee-weakening, swoony kiss. The one with Carson was almost there. Chloe took a bite of her food and then turned back to Shayla. What about yours? Shayla looked up at the ceiling and paused for several moments, the other girls waiting in suspense for her response. I think I'll give it a 4.5. Something pulled him away too soon, so I didn't get the full effect of it. Ruby wished she had earplugs, not knowing if she could survive dinner if they kept talking about Carson as if he were man candy. He was definitely attractive in all the areas that were important, and that sweetness in the cabin made her swoon just thinking about it. But bad boy headlines crept up into her mind, and she wondered if she really had lost the boy she'd loved before. The old Carson wouldn't have kissed a bunch of girls, even if it were for a reality show. Nearing the end of dinner, Lyanna pointed out the window. Will you look at that? The others turned to see what she meant, and Ruby stopped chewing as she saw Carson and Ashley out by the pool, kissing. He had his arm around her waist, and they were kissing with more passion than Ruby's kiss with him. It was like a train wreck before her eyes, and she couldn't pull away from it. After at least 
30 more seconds of lip-to-lip contact, as Shayla would call it, Ruby took her plate to the sink and ran upstairs, making it to her room just in time before the waterworks erupted. She didn't care at that point what the other girls thought of her. All she knew was that her heart was cracking and she didn't know how to fix it. The other girls all had experiences kissing other guys. Carson had been her first, and only. She'd thought she was the same to him until she'd seen the newspapers. But what could she expect from a hockey player anyway? She sobbed into her pillow, a tension headache setting in. Pulling the covers over her, she fell into a deep, dreamless sleep. Chapter 27 The next day was the next flower ceremony, and Carson tried to think of who he should send home. After getting to know some of the girls more over the past few days, he got along with several of them. He wondered if that had to do with those personality tests he'd taken before the show started. Walking without his boot, he made his way out to the pool, hoping to get in some cardio that wouldn't injure him further. As he reached the edge, he noticed the blue water was already occupied. He took a step back, watching as the woman's strokes cut through the water in a steady motion. It wasn't until he got closer that he realized it was Ruby. Should he turn and run? He'd successfully avoided her for the past few days, just like he'd promised Dan. It was difficult as he felt that connection they'd once had take hold and strengthen again. But with his emotions every which way, he couldn't make any promises to anyone just yet. Ruby stopped and stood up, pulling her hair back behind her. When she stepped out of the pool, he watched her body, the red one-piece swimsuit hugging all her curves. She pulled a towel over herself and started drying off, stopping the moment she saw him standing at the other end. His hesitation to go back to the guest house had cost his anonymity. Good morning. How was your swim? He took a few steps toward her, smiling when he saw her glance down at his bare chest and swim trunks. Fine. The word came out clipped, and Carson's defenses started to rise. How have you been? I haven't been able to see you in the past few days. He was only a foot away from her, and the temptation to pull her to him and crush her lips to his was strong. He kept his hands in the pockets of his trunks and waited for her answer. Not as busy as you've been, I'd wager. It must be exhausting. She turned her head, focusing on drying off her arms. Carson frowned. What's exhausting? All the acting. The girls were all talking about their kisses with you last night at the dinner table. And what happened at the end? We had a front row seat to your makeout session with Ashley. Fury burned in her green eyes, bringing out her auburn hair even more. He'd never seen her like this before, nor had she ever been this blunt. Heat rose to his own cheeks. She'd seen that? Oh, man. It wasn't a makeout session. It's called playing for the cameras. Dan said I had to make it fair for all of the girls since we were together overnight. I... He probably didn't say you had to go around making out with all the other girls, though. Did he? Her eyes flashed, pulling up his defenses. I'm just trying to get through this show, all right? You don't know what it was like eight years ago when you left me alone. Dumping me because of my profession? He took a step forward, frustration pulsing through his body. Ruby's chin jutted upwards and she frowned. Without saying another word, she turned and walked into the cabin. Why did things have to be so complicated with her? No, he shouldn't have been kissing all the girls. But it was something Dan encouraged. The girls usually initiated it anyway. His mind went back to the kiss with Ruby. He'd thought that could be the start of their future, but he'd managed to ruin it without thinking. Would he never be good enough for her? Chapter 28 
Ruby went through the motions as she got ready for the flower ceremony that afternoon. Dan had announced that they were holding it in the afternoon to give the crew enough time to prep it for the following night. It would also make it easier to get the girl who lost back to the city, since the drive was over two hours. She pulled on a simple dress, the bottom flaring out and hitting her at the knees. The deep navy color made her auburn tresses stand out more than she was used to, but at this point, she didn't care. Visions of him kissing Ashley kept invading her thoughts, and his nonchalance that morning by the pool? How could he be mad at her for something he'd done? You look lovely, Ruby. Olivia had come out of the bathroom and was now putting on pearl earrings. You too, Ruby said, her voice somber. Olivia wrapped her arms around Ruby's shoulders and pulled her in for a hug. Maybe we don't know the whole story, girl. If we both survive this ceremony today, you should ask him about it. Ruby had spilled everything to Olivia that morning when she'd come in from swimming. It had been therapeutic, but then again, Olivia expected her to move past those emotions and forgive Carson. Ruby just wanted to wallow. They moved down the stairs, taking one of the six seats left. The makeup people came through, inspecting the girl's face and applying swipes of foundation or changing out lipstick. One of the crew brought out five pink daisies in a vase and set it on the table near the wall. Only one of them would be going home this week. Ruby's heart thundered in her throat. Did she hope she'd be going home? Or was she crazy to think she could stay and emotionally survive after this show? The one thing she'd accomplished by being there was that she spoke more often and even defended herself a few times. Things she hadn't accomplished in nearly 27 years, she'd done in almost three weeks on a reality TV show. She never would have believed it if she hadn't experienced it. The girls chatted, but Ruby wasn't up to participating. She sat quietly, waiting for this part to be over. Carson's face flashed in her mind, the anger in it after her comments earlier that day. She shouldn't have been so harsh. But then again, she'd reacted, instead of bottling everything up and hiding it deep inside her. Darren English walked out, his suit making him look more like a blueberry than anything. The camera light switched on, and so did his personality. Good afternoon, ladies. We're happy to have you here for another daisy ceremony. Now, while it's a sad time for most of you, after spending so much time together over the past week, it's also one step closer to finding a match for our leading man. Carson Carver, come on out for today's episode. His words made Ruby feel like they were on a game show instead of a show about finding love. You're the next contestant on. Darren slapped Carson in the back and looked at the ladies again. How did this week go? Are you getting closer to finding your true love? Carson flashed a smile for the camera when he said, I sure hope so, Darren. The whole thing was fake. The smile, the attitude. Had he really changed that much? So much for deeds, not words, Carson. They took time out to show some of the highlights for the week. None of the frames showing anything about Ruby. It was somewhat of a relief as she now wanted to forget the whole thing. It seemed Carson had. We do want to update our viewers on one of the dates this week that we didn't get film of. I think the story will help the audience know what happened to your leg, too, since you're wearing a boot. Ruby looked down and almost snorted. Carson must have taken off the boot for the show because he stood there with his dress shoes on, no evidence of a boot. She saw Carson give him a side eye, and Darren stepped back, waiting for Carson to answer. Our first one-on-one -on -one of the week was a hike with, uh, Ruby Hunter. He glanced her way for a second, but for some reason his discomfort soothed her anxiety about what would happen. A flash flood happened, wiping out the bridge the camera crew was on. 
Ruby and I took shelter down the road, and then some people from the show were able to pick us up the next day. Ruby nodded, agreeing to the fair summary. What she wasn't ready for was the screen flashing to her interview from right after the event. Her hair looked dirty and a few spots of mud clouded her face. She remembered the words and questions from Darren, but it was strange to see herself on screen. When it got to the last question, she turned to watch Carson instead of the video of herself. You didn't kiss. Not even a little peck? came Darren's words, echoing in her brain. After she'd walked out of the room on screen, Carson turned to look at her, a question in his eyes. She shook her head and looked down, hoping the moment would pass and they could get on with the show. Miss Hunter, Darren said, walking over to her. What made you walk out of the interview room? What was this, an interrogation? A lot of things. Sometimes the questions you ask aren't worth answering, and others are personal. She stared up at the man, determined to keep a strong face and not cry. Okay, then. The host walked back to Carson. Should we see who will make it through to the next week and who will be going home? Ruby finally looked over at him, surprised to see Carson cringe. Yes. All right, let's have you call up the first few girls. Darren stepped away, walking out of the room. Ruby breathed a sigh of relief. The man was getting on her last nerve. Carson stepped toward the vase and pulled out two flowers. He called up Shayla and Ashley, giving them the flowers after a few words. Olivia and Lyanna went next, both receiving the pink daisy. He then called up Chloe and Ruby. I had a great time with you both this week. There were some sticky situations for sure, but we made it through them. He locked eyes with Ruby for a moment. As much as she didn't want to feel anything, her knees threatened to buckle as she saw those deep blue irises. This is the toughest part of the competition, trying to decide who should go home and who should stay especially when we only have so much time together in between. I made this decision an hour ago, and had I known some things before making it, the results might be different. A hush fell over the room, and Carson turned to Chloe. Chloe, will you accept this daisy? The girl started shaking, running up to kiss his cheek and take the flower. She turned and sat with the remaining girls, nervous chatter filling up the room. Ruby stood, her head high, and gave Carson a small smile. Darren English came out and took her by the shoulders. We are so sorry, but it looks like your suitor journey ends here. For some reason, that made Ruby feel lighter than she had in years. The guilt she'd carried for so long after breaking up with Carson was gone. Yes, her heart still beat faster at the thought of him, but she knew she could move on, make it through whatever came at her in the next months or years. Maybe she'd even accept the three matches Meg had offered. We need you in here for a final interview, Miss Hunter, a camera woman said, ushering her back into the interview room. Ruby took a seat and waited. After several minutes, she wondered what had happened. Maybe Darren had refused to interview her after what happened the last time? She could only hope. It had to have been at least 15 minutes later that the door opened, and instead of the show's host, Carson walked into the room. No one walked in behind him to man the camera, and something about the situation made Ruby tense. What did he want now? To gloat? Why did you walk out of that interview? He leaned forward, his arms supporting his upper body on his legs. I was done with the questions. They really need to hire a different host for the show. Ruby folded her arms, not breaking her gaze from Carson's face. He frowned, pursing his lips. That was it? You didn't answer the last question because you didn't want to answer him? 
His eyes bounced around her face, and she wondered what he was looking for. I'm sorry, Carson. I don't know what you want me to say. I'm just ready to go home now. She stood, and for the second time in a week, walked out of the interview room, racing upstairs to get her things. Carson blew out a breath. He'd doubted his decision to send Ruby home the moment he saw her interview. She'd been so hard to read for most of this show that seeing just a little bit of spunk made him think he'd just made the worst mistake of his life. But with her attitude just then, maybe he dodged a bullet. Again. Dan approached him and said, We've got some date ideas for next week. Do you have a minute we can run them by you? Shaking his head, Carson said, Not now. My head is pounding, and it's time to get the boot back on. Can we go over it in the morning? With a quick nod, Dan said, Sure thing. Just come find me in the morning and we can decide when to do which dates. Is there anything I can get you? A sleeping pill, maybe? As much as he'd told his heart not to get attached, he felt the threads he'd used to sew it up the first time coming loose. He'd need to get through the next day in order to continue on the show. The director nodded. I'll have one sent over. Fifteen minutes later, at five o'clock in the evening, Carson had pulled all the drapes shut, and soon the thoughts in his mind dulled as he fell asleep. Chapter 29 It had only taken a few moments for the tough outer shell she'd put on all evening to crack. She'd made it to her room and the emotions surged, making it impossible to push back anymore. The look on Carson's face as he sat before her haunted her mind. The crew had told her to pack earlier in the day, but she'd been in her own world, not worried about a timely departure even though, looking back, she had it coming. A knock sounded at the door and she did her best to swallow her tears, hoping her voice didn't sound too emotional. I'll be down in a few minutes, just getting the last of my things. She looked around her at the clothes in piles on her bed. It's me. Olivia walked into the room, arms outstretched. She pulled Ruby into a hug taking some of the frustration and worry away from her. It will be all right. This can't be the end of your story. Sobbing, Ruby nodded, pulling away from Olivia's shoulder. Great, I left a big water spot on your shoulder. Olivia shrugged. Eh, it'll dry. It's not like I'll have much reason to go out since you're leaving. Ruby gave a quick laugh, wiping under her nose with the side of her hand. So what happened? There was a commotion outside the house, and then Carson came stomping into the room? Is everything okay? Ruby shook her head. No, I thought it was, but it's not. He asked me about when I walked out of the interview. Olivia moved her hand in a circular fashion, as if to nudge Ruby into revealing more details. Blowing out a big breath, Ruby turned off her mic and said, Carson is the only person I've ever kissed. Ever. It's a personal thing for me, and the fact that Darren wanted to know everything about what happened up there, I couldn't stand to sit there and take it. There's no video evidence of it anywhere, and I didn't want it to be some fling thing. At the time, I thought he felt something for me again. Then I had to hear and see all the other girls go on and on about kissing him. Oh, girl, just know I haven't even held hands with him, if it makes you feel any better. That got Ruby laughing, something she needed. You don't have to do that. If you like him, go for him. I won't get in your way. Yeah, about that. I'm pretty sure if I ever had a brother, he'd be like Carson. There are no sparks flying through this girl's body. Olivia's voice added some sass as she waved her arms up and down her slender frame. Ruby turned, throwing the rest of her things in the suitcases. She'd go through it all once she got home. Turning to Olivia, she said, 
Stay in touch? Of course. I'm hoping I have a guy I can gush about with you soon. They hugged once more before Ruby rolled her suitcases out the door and lifted them down the stairs. She gave them to Stan, who loaded them into a small crossover vehicle. For once, Ruby was grateful to the show for not shoving her into a limo again. She turned to look back at the cabin, as if saying goodbye. To what? She wasn't quite sure just yet. Whether it was to her past or her future, she hoped she'd learned enough lessons to make it worth it. How are you doing, Miss Hunter? Stan asked as he opened the back door for her. She shook her head and moved to open the front door. I think I'll sit up here with you. I get a little carsick, and this trip is way too long for backseat conversation. She smiled at him as she slid in, and he clicked the door shut behind her. Taking position behind the steering wheel, Stan put the car into drive and steered them down the winding curves, away from the cabin. I was sad to see you go, Miss Hunter. Please, call me Ruby. Her smile felt more like a grimace. I have mixed feelings about it, too. But I've accomplished the things I set out to do, and so I can't look at it like it was all a wash. Stan nodded. It's always good to have a positive attitude. They drove for a few more minutes in silence when he spoke again, his voice softer. You were her. Huh? The girl he dated before the show? Ruby had completely forgotten about that. She nodded, her throat constricting with emotion. She pushed it back, not wanting the man next to her to wonder if she had lost a bolt or two. How did you know? Just bits and pieces here and there, but I put them all together just now. He pointed to his head like that was answer enough. Another awkward silence fell before he spoke again. How do you feel about him now? His sheepish expression made her smile, but he kept glancing over at her, maybe hoping she'd say something. I still love him, I guess but I'm not sure if it's because I saw the old Carson, the one from when we were dating and pre-NHL. Our time at the cabin was refreshing, like we were able to get over our past and move on. The Carson in the media seems like a whole other person somehow. Changing the radio station, Stan said, Sometimes our past hurts make us more cautious the second time around, and sometimes people do things for dumb reasons. Like the director telling Carson he needed to stay away from you and spend time with the other girls. Ruby's jaw dropped. Why she was so surprised, she wasn't sure. But to have the facts laid out before her still felt like a knife cutting through her heart. And the kisses? Mostly initiated by the girls. Stan's lip tightened into a line. Well, his kiss with Ashley didn't look like he was pulling away too hard. Stan leaned forward over the wheel, watching out for the large boulder in the path of the road. As he eased over it, he sat back. Did you ask him about it? Ruby glanced at her fingers. No, I yelled at him for it. Stan chuckled a moment, and Ruby was grateful for the sound, easing up the knots forming in her stomach just a bit. If your paths cross again, and I'm sure they will, ask him. I'm sure he'll have a good explanation. Giving him a tight smile, Ruby turned to look at the road. The song Zandra came on, an older song that had been redone by a new group. She'd always loved the old music, and Silver Tongue was a favorite. It already helped her spirits lift. She couldn't think about talking to Carson right now. This trip would give her enough time to mourn the past and ready herself for what was to come because she was not going back to the person she was before the show. Carson, are you in there? A familiar voice sounded in his dreams, along with an incessant pounding at the door. It took a few minutes for Carson to realize the noises were real. Throwing back the covers, he limped over and opened the door. Sterling, I thought you were in the city. Carson used his thumb and forefinger to rub his eyes trying to clear his sight from the dryness. I was, but I finished up all the business I had. 
Dan's updated me on what happened last night. Sterling sat at the table, twisting the salt shaker around in his fingers. Last night? Carson stood, walking over to the curtains on the windows and pulled them back, wincing for a moment as his eyes worked to adjust to the bright light. He glanced out at the sun, just rising from the east. He'd slept through the night. Sterling gave him a curious look. Everything all right? Uh, yeah. I fell asleep early last night, and I'm surprised I made it to this morning. Stretching his arms above him, he said, I haven't slept that good in ages. So, does that mean you're not torn up about kicking your ex fiance off the show? Sterling frowned as he inspected the room. Carson coughed, trying to figure out how he felt about the situation from the night before. Torn up is a strong term. She hurt me once. I didn't think I could make it through that again. Kind of a cut ties before any pain happens to you, huh? Reaching for a pillow, Carson threw it at his agent. You're awfully blunt today. Tell me about business. Did you have to take care of anything for me? As a matter of fact, I did. I have some potential meetings to set up for when this is all over. Just keep playing your part well, and we'll get things to happen. Sterling stood and moved toward the door. Dan's out there waiting for you to make an entrance. He said something about going over the date list. Carson groaned. He wasn't in the mood to talk dates. He needed to get this show over with as soon as possible. He just hoped he hadn't made things worse for his reputation. Chapter 30 Stan dropped Ruby off at her house the night before. She was grateful not to have to lug her bags onto the bus. She pulled out the keys she'd tucked into a side pocket of the smaller suitcase when she'd left a couple weeks before, opening the door. Everything was quiet, just as it usually was. But after being surrounded by people for so long, it made her a little uncomfortable. She searched each room, making sure no one had broken in or decided to take up residence since she'd been gone. Breathing clearer, she made her way back to the suitcases by the door. Deciding to change first, she walked into her bedroom and pulled on her pajamas. She sighed as she slid under the cool covers. After the week she'd had, she was ready for her own bed. It didn't take long for her to fall asleep. Her dreams centered around the past 72 hours. Every time her brain played back the words she'd spat at Carson by the pool, Ruby felt herself cringe. She hoped he wouldn't take it to heart. The sun streamed through the window early the next morning, and she got up and took a shower. Walking downstairs, she figured she might as well unpack so it didn't sit at the end of her bed for another week. She wheeled the suitcases into the laundry room, hoisting the first bag up onto the counter next to the dryer. As she opened it, the clothes smelled like a mixture of pine and wood. Pulling out the clothes she'd worn on the day of the hike, she could still smell Carson's cologne, even after washing them at the cabin. She placed the shirt back into the suitcase and walked out to the living room, turning on a favorite music playlist. The silence was odd and she couldn't pretend to ignore it. It spoke of loneliness, and she couldn't believe she'd lived this sheltered for so long. She'd go back to work on Monday, answer emails and get things ready for the extension clients she still had. Prepared was how she liked to be, and the third week of June was still acceptable. After throwing in the first load of laundry, she moved to the couch in the living room. Turning on the TV, she flipped through channels. Something caught her eye on one of them, and she paused, trying to catch up with what the hosts of the show were discussing. I was sad he sent her home. Of all of them, I think he had a real connection with her, a blonde woman said. Another one, with darker hair sitting next to the first, said, Are you kidding? Did you not see the clip of her yelling at him by the pool? There's nothing wrong with that, an auburn-haired woman said. Sometimes we need to tell the men we love how we really feel, better than beating around the bush, hoping they'll get it one day. 
The audience started clapping, drowning out what another woman began to say. The blonde woman turned toward the camera, speaking directly to it. We're almost out of time, but we want to hear what you have to say about last night's episode of The Suitor. She rattled off several ways to contact their show, and Ruby turned the channel, dumbstruck at what she'd just heard. She knew she'd agreed to be on a reality TV show, but to have clips of it where people were commenting on it was unsettling. Was this how Carson felt with everyone talking about his every move? Guilt set in. She didn't think she could find a way to relate to Carson's high-profile life, but it seemed like people were already talking. Turning off the TV, she headed into the kitchen, hoping she could find something edible before she went to the store that morning. The fridge was almost empty, other than the condiments, but she was able to find a package of English muffins tucked away in the freezer. That would have to do for today. Looking around, the loneliness crept in again. Ruby dressed quickly and walked out of the door with her purse, ready for some human interaction. She let out a chuckle at the thought of where she'd started out before the show to where she was now. But for her busy mind, she needed action, not a silent home and nothing to do. Maybe she could take up a hobby now that she was doing so well in the social area. She wished she'd thought of exposure therapy when she was younger. She might not have had to fight it for so long. Chapter 31 The next two weeks passed faster than he'd expected them to. Dan had piled on the dates and activities, hoping to make the next episode as exciting as the last. He walked into the guest house each night exhausted, and his training regimen suffered. But try as he might, he couldn't get Ruby's face out of his mind, her determination plaguing him. At the last two ceremonies, he'd sent Lyanna and then Shyla home. He'd heard both girls leaving in tears, and part of him felt awful. But he knew he had to make progress on cutting down the numbers or he'd be stuck here until the new year. It was interview time, something he dreaded more than anything else on the show. Ruby had a point about the dumb questions. It seemed as though Darren had looked up what to ask on the internet, and they made it difficult to give a decent answer to. Darren entered with one of the crew and sat down. The host didn't speak until the red light flipped on, and then he smiled up at Carson. How did this week go for you, Carson? He was tempted to give the standard teenage answer of, fine. But he figured the sooner he answered the questions, the sooner he'd be able to go outside and do anything else. It was good, overall. I feel we packed in a lot, which is good because it gives me time to get to know the ladies more. Have you narrowed it down to one yet? I know you just sent home two ladies, but is there a certain lady who's caught your eye? Pasting on a fake smile, Carson shook his head. It's still a tight race. I'd have to say. A future is a big deal, and I don't want to take that lightly. Whether it's my future in hockey or a future partner in life, I hope to give it the same care. The red light clicked off, and Carson nodded to Darren before leaving the room. Down to three. Dan hoped to eliminate one girl by the end of the week and send him out to the homes of the final two girls. The thought made his stomach turn. He'd gotten somewhat used to this peaceful spot, and it would be hard to go back to the hustle and bustle of the city and his regular schedule. He just hoped he could get the redhead out of his mind sooner rather than later. Ruby strolled into the building of Love Austin, Wednesday night. She wasn't sure she needed the class, but the boredom of her former routine was causing her to find ways to amuse herself. Walking up the stairs to the second floor, she saw the class was already in session. Meg looked over and smiled. Ruby, what a surprise to have you here. Come join us and we'll catch up after. Forty-five minutes later, Meg led Ruby down to her office, flipping on the light as they entered. How did it go for you, Ruby? 
I've watched all the episodes, and there's such a difference in you. Ruby grinned, grateful it was coming from someone else and not just her own biased opinion. Thank you. I feel like I've improved quite a bit. There are still times when I retreat back into myself, but for the most part, it's easier for me to communicate and not worry about crowds. Okay, the crowds on the T downtown are still overwhelming, but I think most of my courage comes from facing my past and moving forward. Ah, yes, the director informed me about your previous relationship. I guess we need to add a question about the names of past relationships. Meg laughed and Ruby joined in, looking at everything from the outside. There's no way either of them could know that Carson had been her only relationship ever. So how are you doing now that you're home? Most days I'm good. There are some where I wish I were still there and I still had that chance to be with Carson again. But it's hard when someone changes, you know? I saw glimpses of the man I've always loved, but it's hard to be vulnerable around the cameras all the time. It was hard to separate the real from the fake. Meg nodded. I can see how that would be. What's holding you back from going after him? What? Ruby's eyes shot to Meg's. A sliver of a smile crossed Meg's lips. From everything I've seen and learned about your time on the show, it seems you love him. Part of me thinks it's stronger than the last time you were together. Ruby laughed, the sound hollow. I watched him make out with one of the girls. How can I get past that image in my head? Love is rough. Let me tell you, sometimes we just have to wait for the opening to bring us back together. Parker and I have only been dating a little over a month, but it's amazing what a little talking can do to solve some problems. If you want to be with him, that's something you'll have to figure out. But don't rule him out completely. Meg winked at her, and Ruby wondered if there was something the matchmaker was holding back. Walking out of the office, Ruby reflected on Meg's words, pulling each of her feelings up to look at in her mind one by one. The frustration, the anger, the fear, the happiness. Was she right? Shaking her head, Ruby wasn't sure what she could do at this point, even if she did have feelings for Carson. She really just needed to move on with her life and use those experiences to find happiness elsewhere. Chapter 32 The bags were all packed and sat near the front door. Carson had cleared out the guest house where he'd stayed for the past month, and everything was loaded into the limo. The show was nearing its end, and in some ways he was ready for it all to be done. He still had moments when he wondered if he should have sent Ruby home, but he couldn't dwell on that now. Darren stood in front of a camera, looking different in a polo shirt and a pair of khaki pants. Rubbing his hands together, he said, Good morning, ladies, Carson. He nodded his head at all three. You've got everything ready to go. The show has organized one more group date before Carson makes his way to meet your families. Are you ready to go? Carson nodded and climbed into the limo. Ashley sat next to him, and Olivia smiled and put a few inches of space between them. He'd sent Chloe home in the last ceremony, bringing him to the last few moments as the suitor. He thought about the two girls around him, wondering what had made him keep either. Was it the fact that he hadn't thought he'd ever get here, and those were the obvious choices when it came to the flower ceremony? Seeing all the people milling about the streets in Boston, Carson decided he needed to buy a cabin. Not necessarily in the Berkshires, but somewhere he could get away to think every once in a while. Living in the city had its conveniences, as he was able to get just about anywhere with public transportation. But the outdoors reminded him of his childhood and of an auburn-haired girl who held a piece of his heart and passed. The limo pulled close to Yaki Way, the road that led to Fenway Park, home of the Boston Red Sox. 
Stan opened the window divider between them. You're heading in for a great game today. It's against the Yankees. I'll meet you around here when it's finished. I'd come open the door, but they're already honking at me out there. Here are the tickets and have a great game. He handed the tickets to Carson and tipped his hat to them. Ashley stepped out of the limo first, and Carson realized what she was wearing. High heels, black slacks, and a silver flowy top. She looked ready for a night on the town rather than fourth row behind home plate. Carson could pull a bunch of strings and still not be able to get those seats, but the directors had somehow done it. He climbed out and helped Olivia exit the car, dressed in jeans and a nicer blouse wearing sneakers. Are you ready to go? Excitement bubbled up in him, and he couldn't believe they were seeing a game against the Yankees. Smelling the food, his stomach reminded him he hadn't eaten that morning, and the long drive had only increased the hunger. He stopped in one of the lines for concessions, turning to the girls while they waited. Have you ever been to a Red Sox game? He asked the girls. Yes, Ashley said, somewhat bored. I've been a lot with my family. When he turned to Olivia, she smiled. I've been a few times, but usually my view is from right field. Carson had grown up watching games from right field. Fond memories of his parents taking him as often as they could. He'd never had much talent for the sports, but he loved the way the city buzzed before, during, and after Red Sox games. Do you want a hot dog or something else here? I'll take a Fenway, Frank. Olivia said, almost dancing with excitement. Ashley looked up at the menu and wrinkled her nose. I'll take some popcorn. Grabbing their food, they made their way to their seats, just as the first pitch was thrown out. Sitting down, Carson was amazed at the view. They would be able to see just about everything. He knew what it was like to have extreme fans, and he could only imagine what it would be like to have people shouting this close to the batter. Luckily, hockey was faster, so he didn't always hear the taunts. Opening up the ketchup and mustard packets, he spread them onto his hot dog. He took a bite and swallowed, savoring the taste after all the expensive meals the show had set up for their dates. He turned to Ashley and said, Are you sure you don't want one of these? You have to have one when you come to the park. I'll pass. Popcorn will work for now. She set her soda down in the cup holder and ate a few popcorn kernels. Her eyes glared out at the field, her jaw set. Strike one, the umpire called out. The next pitch was a foul ball. A slider sailed in for the third pitch and the batter stretched out his arms as far as they would go while swinging, missing the ball as it landed in the catcher's mitt. Strike three! Carson cheered along with Olivia and the crowd around them. He always loved seeing a great start to a game. Around the fifth inning, with the Red Sox up 5-0, Ashley turned to him. Can we head out? Carson frowned as he looked at her. Didn't she realize these were the best seats they were ever going to get? Are you all right? He choked out, stealing a sideways glance at the field as he heard the crack of the bat. I'm bored. The Red Sox are winning right now anyway. Can we go? She pleaded with him. Olivia is having fun, and so am I. We'll stay a bit longer. Once we leave here, I think we drop you off at your parents' house. Ruby would stay if she were here. Where had that thought come from? They'd gone to a game a week or two after the first time they'd broken up. Carson could only afford the seats in the outfield at the time. She'd been so excited to get a Fenway Frank, and she'd cheered the entire game. His shy girlfriend had been almost an extrovert, mingling with the people around them, bonding with them as the plays were made. She might not have always understood what was going on, but she learned fast, especially when it came to hockey. As he thought about all their conversations, he realized Ruby wasn't the same woman he'd loved eight years before. 
She was a stronger version, and the thought of her sent a dull ache into his chest. He glanced at the woman next to him. Olivia felt like a sister to him, and Ashley's true colors were starting to show. He'd need someone who would be willing to go to things with him, to learn to enjoy the same things. Thinking back, he'd watched plenty of romance movies with Ruby curled up in his arms. The trade-off was worth it. Maybe, when this was all over, they could try again. Or was it worth the risk of a shattered heart? They'd finally left in the seventh inning, when the Red Sox were up 8-1. to one. It still didn't make Carson comfortable, because, for some reason, those last few innings always turned out to be the most exciting. He just hoped the Yankees didn't make a comeback. Stan met them outside and drove them to Ashley's house first. She lived in a large colonial home with several windows across the front entry. The estate sat over a large piece of property, and with it being in the suburbs, he knew it had to cost a pretty penny. After helping carry her bags to the front door, Carson slid back into the limo, giving Olivia a quick smile. She loves you, you know? Olivia's voice came from his side. Excuse me? He turned to look at her, pinching his eyebrows together. Ruby, she loves you like crazy. Carson shifted, folding his arms and staring at the other side of the limo. She sure has a funny way of showing it. First she breaks off our engagement, and then she yells at me for kissing other girls. Olivia gave him a look that reminded him of his mother. Wouldn't you feel the same if she started kissing every guy in sight? She had a point. Curious, he asked. You're the only one who hasn't tried to kiss me. Why? Because Ruby is my friend, and I came on this show hoping to forget a guy I can never have, but it seems like I miss him even more. Ruby was hurt the day you kicked her off but you should give her another chance. Olivia nodded as he looked at her. Carson gestured to the car around them. You know how crazy that sounds, right? You're one of the final two and you're telling me to go after someone I've already kicked off? How would I convince her to forgive me? It's not like I can take back kissing the other girls. You'll figure it out. I'm just an outsider, but I think you're trying to protect yourself from getting hurt again. Olivia paused and said, Ruby is just worried you'll be like a lot of professional athletes, travel to a different city for a game and find someone there. I think that's why she took seeing you kiss Ashley so hard. But I... Let me finish. Olivia held up a finger and Carson closed his mouth. The limo had come to a stop, and Olivia's words sped up. If you want to know how she feels... Have Dan play back the conversation I had with her after the flower ceremony. She turned off her mic, but I never did. You'll see how she really feels about you. She flashed him a smile and got out, taking her luggage into a large apartment building. It wasn't the newest thing he'd ever seen, but the outside looked like it had been kept up with the buildings around it. Getting out of the car, Carson made his way to the front seat. He dialed Dan as he got in. Hey, Carson. Footage for the next episode looks great. What can I help you with? Carson scratched the top of his head. Do you have any material from Ruby and Olivia's room right before Ruby went home? Hmm. I can take a look and let you know. That would be great. Thank you. After a few other announcements, they hung up. As he turned off the phone, Carson looked at the road ahead of them, surprised when Stan spoke. I could have opened the door for you, Mr. Carver. Stan, for the last time, I'm Carson, and I'm fine up here. It gets boring in the back when there's no one else there. I can't imagine, but then again, I wouldn't want to be you either with the decision you need to make. Stan grinned at him, wiggling his eyebrows. Carson chuckled and nodded his head. You're right about that. Carson studied the man's face. He had to be in his late 40s, a round stomach inches away from the steering wheel. Are you married, Stan? Yes, sir. 23 years this coming August. 
How did you meet? Surprising himself for asking this many questions, Carson glanced out the side window, hoping to not create pressure. After a few moments of silence, Stan said, She was my sister's best friend growing up. I'd legged her for quite a few years, but then she moved out of state for college. We reconnected six years later and hit it off. So you didn't date before she left? His story sounded close to home. He nodded. We went on a few dates, but she had heard several horror stories about long-distance relationships. When you're only 18, it's scary to make lifelong decisions. I didn't blame her for it. We were young, and it worked out better that we married in our mid-twenties rather than right out of high school. They'd arrived at Carson's building by that point, and Carson stood on the sidewalk, blowing out a deep breath. He thanked the man and walked into the apartment. Sitting on his couch, he let Stan's words run over and over in his head. It had worked out better for Stan and his wife to marry later. Would that be the case with Ruby? Did she even have feelings for him anymore? He pictured the anger as she'd chastised him for the kiss she'd witnessed. Even after kissing all the other girls, it was her kiss that drove energy pulsing through him. Chapter 33 Dan called Carson into an office downtown the day before they'd planned the family visits. Taking a seat in the chair in front of the director's desk, Carson looked up, curious as to what the man had found. Okay, I pulled the footage you requested, as well as some Stan suggested I look for. Are you ready to see it? Carson shrugged. Yeah, shoot. Both pieces of audio only took about five minutes to play out, but with each word he heard, he felt his heart swell. Sure, not all the things Ruby had described were perfect, but she'd said she still loved him. Hope and faith filled him. He had to find a way to make it up to her, to show her she was the one for him, the only one for him. Dan must have seen something on his face because he asked, You look like you're scheming. That I am, and I'm going to need your help. Ruby rummaged through the paperwork one of her clients had just dropped off. It was three folders full of receipts and any financial document from the past year. The hardest part was there was no rhyme or reason to the organization of it. She'd been working on a system to sort the items for the past hour, but felt like she'd made no progress. Glancing out the large window near her office, she smiled as she watched the little boy across the street playing with a ball. He looked too small to go to school just yet, but his skills as he dribbled seemed above average. The sun was setting and she shut the folder, determined to work on it again in the morning. Flipping the TV on, she pulled a lap blanket over her legs. She'd made it almost through the loop of channels when a familiar face stared back at her. Glancing at the clock on the wall, she saw it was the time the suitor usually aired. The recap showed Carson visiting Ashley's family at a house bigger than the large cabin they'd filmed at and Olivia's was at a modest townhome somewhere in a suburb of Boston. Darren appeared on screen, and Ruby raised the controller to change it, when something popped up on the bottom of the television. We love twists here at The Suitor, and this is our biggest yet. We want to give the audience the chance to bring back one of the girls for Carson. That means he'll be choosing from three women in the finale. So who will it be? With 10 choices, make sure to call in with your favorite. Voting ends at noon tomorrow. A mixture of emotions erupted inside of her. She'd just begun to accept her fate, and now she had to wait to see which woman the audience decided to bring back? She was never going on another reality show again. She couldn't handle the stress of it all anymore. Chapter 34 Ruby's phone rang and she turned toward it, freezing as she saw Dan Strom's name on the screen. What would he want? 
Hello? Hi, Miss Hunter. I hope you're well. She gulped and said, I was until you called. Is there something wrong? Her heart pounded. Ever since she'd seen the announcement two nights ago, she'd been afraid to leave her phone too far away from her. She wanted to chastise herself, tell her she was setting her heart up for pain once again. But that was coming from her brain, and it seemed like it had been disconnected from the vital organ in her chest for some time. Dan laughed, and Ruby relaxed her shoulders against her office chair. I'm calling to tell you that we want to bring you back to the show. Huh? The words were muddled, and she couldn't tell if she was just dreaming or if she needed to clean out her ears. You are the winner of the audience vote to bring back one of the contestants? Olivia will be there in an hour to pick you up. Sorry, Olivia is coming here? I thought she was still a part of the show. Ruby leaned forward on the desk, cradling her forehead in her hand. Dan paused before saying, All the ladies will be there tonight, but I'll let her explain that to you. Don't worry about bringing anything. We'll have wardrobe and makeup on site to take care of you. Congratulations, Miss Hunter. Uh, thank you? The call went dead, and Ruby wanted to kick herself for being so awkward. She definitely wasn't perfect at communication yet. Her stomach seemed to register the nerves before her brain did, and she closed her eyes. Would she be able to handle the pressure again? She'd just gotten back into a more normal routine, with more human interaction, that is. She thought of Carson. What would he think? Would he be just as irritated as he had been the last time she'd seen him? Or would he forgive her for all the outside forces persuading her opinions of him? A text chimed on Ruby's phone, and she swiped to see it was from an unknown number. Are you ready to go? Who is this? Olivia! With a quick pause, Ruby pinched herself, trying to see if this was all real. A knock sounded at the door, and when she opened it, her newest friend stood there. You didn't think I was actually coming, did you? Olivia grinned as she leaned in for a hug. Ruby worked to smooth a piece of hair into her ponytail. How did you know? You haven't changed out of your pajamas. I know Dan said things were casual, but maybe put on some jeans. Does everyone know that you're the audience vote? No. With a frown, Ruby looked at her. Then how do you know? Olivia grinned. Dan told me. He was worried you wouldn't come if you didn't have someone pulling you out the door. They'll reveal the audience vote tonight on air. She paused for a minute and then gave her a look of impatience. Go change. We've got to hurry. Sprinting into action, adrenaline pumped through her. She fumbled for the button on her pants and then ran to find a clean shirt. Why hadn't she done laundry this week? Her movements slowed, and it seemed like the rational part of her brain was taking over. She didn't want to go back to the cabin, and she definitely didn't want to see Carson. Or the disappointment of her in his eyes. Could she pretend to be violently sick? That she couldn't get out of bed? Shaking her head, she didn't want to look like the weakling who couldn't handle rejection. She'd learned she could do hard things. Even going on a reality love show, Olivia would drag her there anyway. Let's go, girl. We have to meet the limo in 30 minutes. All the contestants are meeting down by the common. Olivia clapped her hands to get Ruby to move faster, but the reluctance was winning out all of a sudden. Why bother? He'll be proposing to the she-devil in two hours anyway. She stopped in place. You aren't just telling me I'm the audience vote to get me there, right? I'm not good with big public pranks. It sounded prideful to even ask, but she needed to know the answer. Olivia smirked at her. You were the audience favorite by a landslide. And about the proposal, you never know what can happen. Please, I saw the last episode. Carson would fit into Ashley's family with no problems. She hated that fact, and jealousy 
pulled at her. It was probably a good thing she hadn't made it to the last round. Her parents might not have allowed the show to film with them around. Does that really matter to you? Olivia's hand was on her hip, a look saying she wanted Ruby to think about it. Ruby pulled her arms in tight across her chest. Maybe. My parents were never fond of him, always thinking he was below them. Carson's parents died while we were in high school. He looked like a kid on Christmas with Ashley's siblings and parents. I can't give him that, even if he did want me. Olivia tugged on Ruby's arm, pulling her outside once she put shoes on. Have you checked social media or anything? Ruby shook her head. No, I haven't had the heart to. What have I missed? Any nuclear threats or bombings worse than my own lack of relationship issues? She tried to laugh, but it sounded more like a cry. None of that. You have to be strong for today. Show Ashley she hasn't won. That would be easier said than done. Chapter 35 As Ruby watched the clock and the traffic around them, a knot pulled at her stomach. Would they make it to the limo in time? What would they do if they didn't? Maybe driving to the cabin would be better in the car. She hadn't gotten carsick when Stan brought her home from the show. Olivia found a spot in a free parking garage away from the meeting point. She and Ruby jumped out and ran down the stairs and the two blocks to the common. A few girls stood around it, and Ruby could see them getting in one by one, Stan closing the door after the last of them entered. Wait, we're coming! Ruby's voice seemed quiet to her own ears, but Stan's head turned, a smile crossing his face. I wondered if the two of you would arrive together. Hop in, most of the other girls are already here. As they slipped into the limo, Ruby was surprised at the chatter already happening. The excitement picked up her spirits somewhat, but she wasn't sure how long it would last. As several of the girls looked their way, they stopped talking, just staring at her. What's wrong? She finally squeaked out. Courage. She needed courage. You dated Carson before the show? Cora asked in disbelief. Frowning, Ruby looked to Olivia for an answer. How did they find out? Shayla gave her an odd look and said, You haven't seen the... Great picture of all of us? Olivia cut her off, making Ruby suspicious. We are going to look amazing for that final shot, right, ladies? The conversations started up again, and Ruby needed answers. What's going on? How do they know I dated Carson? The directors made a statement on the page earlier this morning after the voting ended. It seems there were a lot of speculations going on with the viewers, and when it wouldn't sway the vote anymore, they sent out a small press release. Tingles flooded Ruby's upper body, and she wasn't sure whether to be scared or grateful. The girls were glued to their phones, occasionally commenting on messages from their social media. Most of them were about the audience wondering who would be coming back as the third contestant. She was going to be sick. Nausea swept over her. How could she function with all this pressure? Was this how Carson felt on the ice? He'd always made it look easy, like pressure fueled him to be better. Too bad that didn't help in her case. Closing her eyes, she wished the night were over already. Then she could go back to real life instead of the fantasy she'd been trying to live the past few weeks. The windows hadn't been covered for this trip, and one of the girls pointed out that they weren't heading to the cabin. Ruby was happy about that. She didn't want another two-hour trip home to rehash her disappointment when this was all over. Are we not going to the Berkshires, Stan? Olivia called out. There was a change of plan. The directors wanted this episode to be special, so they picked somewhere outside the city, but not at the cabin. 
The girls oohed and awed while it felt like another punch to the gut for Ruby. How much longer did she have to wait to put all this behind her? Two hours? Three? She might not make it the whole time, but she could focus on the next five minutes. After four sets of those five minutes, the limo came to a stop, and Stan opened the door. The girls filed out, finding themselves in the middle of thick pine trees. If Stan hadn't told them, and the ride had been longer, she would have thought they were in the same forest the cabin was. More like the cabin Carson and I were stranded in. What are we going to do? Go camping? Shayla remarked, causing the rest of the girls to let out a nervous laugh. The director came through some trees and welcomed them. We are excited for the finale of the show. We've decided to change our plans at the last minute, and we're glad all of you could join us back for one last night. He went on to describe the lineup for the night, and it made Ruby tired just thinking about it. Hair and makeup, interviews, announcing the audience vote, and then they'd hear the rest later. Seriously? We can't condense all of this and be done? Ruby knew she needed to be patient, but that just wasn't working. What she'd figured would be a quick few hours was turning into an all-night ordeal. Ladies, please go through there. We've got stations set up for getting you all ready for the camera. We'll start the live broadcast in 90 minutes. Ruby turned to Olivia. We aren't even starting yet. Why can't we just get this over with? She could hear the whine in her voice, but at that point, she didn't care. Oh, Ruby, I'm sure you'll be fine. Besides, why not have one more chance to wow Carson when you walk out there? Ha ha, funny. When they walked through the trees, she found several trailers lined up, along with hair dressing stations. Cords came from two large generators, helping power all the beauty tools and lighting. We couldn't just get ready at the house? One of the hairdressers heard her and nodded. Yeah, that would have been easier by far. Do you know how much work it was to get this all set up? Ruby could only imagine. But when she heard, action, she knew the answer. The company was willing to put in this last hurrah to make the location look even better than it had before. Chapter 36 After hair, nails, and makeup, Ruby was handed a dress bag and told to walk into one of the trailers to get changed, Olivia right behind her. She was curious what kind of dress they'd chosen for her, and excitement rolled through her. As much as she'd hated to think about the night, getting all dressed up was fun. She made a mental note to do it more often. Opening the bag once they got inside, Ruby saw a navy blue dress with sequins and beads stitched into the bodice. The bottom was tulle and flowed out and down to the floor. It was beautiful and as eager as she was to try it on, she needed to keep that hope tamped down. There wouldn't be any more chances with Carson after this. This was a night about a girl looking and feeling beautiful, and that was enough. She pulled the dress up over her hips and slipped her arms in the thick straps, pulling them over her shoulders. The gown felt so soft and light, the fabric lightly swishing with the slightest movement, Olivia had her dress on, a bright pink that accented her makeup. They worked to help each other zip up the dresses and hugged for a few moments. Relax, Olivia said. Ruby's body had begun to shake, and she had to focus on one thing at a time, making sure she didn't collapse. No matter what happens tonight, I'm grateful I got to meet you, Olivia said almost squeezing the air out of her. Good, because it's going to be hard to get rid of me. Ruby smiled, grateful for the positive side to all the cameras and lights. Are you ready? I think I hear them calling us to get to our positions. Ruby gave her a look like she wasn't, and they both laughed. Coming out of the trailer, they were met by one of the production crew, who handed them shoes. 
They'd be walking in high heels through sand. Someone wasn't thinking about this. Go ahead over there and they'll give you your jewelry, the woman said, pointing back to the other end of the hair tables. We get jewelry now, too? Where was this throughout the show? Ruby quipped. Right? Olivia leaned in as they walked over, shoes getting stuck in the ground every so often. It's all about presentation. What girl wants to be proposed to in her PJs? Ruby raised her hand, and Olivia swatted it away. Your vote doesn't count. You look amazing right now, by the way, she said, grinning. You too, girl. Ruby sighed. Thanks. For everything. For putting up with me and for pulling me along. I don't think I could have made it through the show without you. Olivia smiled wider as they put on earrings. After being ushered to their seats, Ruby felt a familiar panic settle in her stomach. She could flee now, before she had to see the handsome face of the guy she loved. That's right, you love him. There's no use in denying it. She wished she had her phone so she could research the success of living after a broken heart. But for now, she had to steal herself from those thoughts. It would be a long enough night as it was. Carson couldn't stand still. He would rather be at the rink than sitting here with the unknown of his feelings. He'd gone through so many emotions in the past 48 hours alone. What were a few more circuits on the emotional roller coaster, right? He pulled at the collar of his tux, wondering if he could loosen the tie somewhat when the director came up. Is your mic on? When Carson nodded, he said, Are you ready for this? If I knew the answer already, I would be. The man slapped Carson on the back. But then your face wouldn't be authentic. We've got all the ladies in their chairs. Do you want to say anything to them? Carson shook his head. Have Darren speak to them. I'll just meet at the spot. He nodded at Dan and walked off. Butterflies of a hundred roller coaster trips pulling at his stomach. He'd gone over the plan so many times that he wished it would just happen already. The pain of not knowing the answer already aided him. Just a few more minutes. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. Chapter 37 Darren English stood before them, and Ruby did her best not to yawn. He'd actually talked to them all without the cameras rolling, and it was more than a shock to several of the ladies. Tension knotted her stomach, like stretching a rubber band a little bit further every few minutes. At last, the red light came on, and Darren turned to the camera, his signature fake smile showing off his white teeth. We welcome all of our viewers to this live finale, where we'll find out who has won the heart of Carson Carver, captain and all-star of the Boston Breeze. We know you're all anxious to find out who the mystery returning contestant is, but we wanted to look back at a few of the moments we've all gone through in the past few weeks. A screen pulled down. And while Ruby knew the viewers would be seeing things on a clearer screen, the projector allowed for the camera crew to get the fresh reactions as the girls watched and remembered their time on the show. As the movie ended, all 12 sets of eyes turned back to Darren, and it was then she remembered most of the girls didn't know who'd won. Why had Dan told her and not the others? I have, in this envelope, the name of the woman the audience wanted to bring back for Carson. He's already been informed about who she is and is offset discussing his final decision with some of his closest friends and family. This is as unscripted as the rest of the show, and we hope you at home are all enjoying it. He opened the flap, Reminding Ruby of the first night when he'd opened the envelopes to tell them about someone already having dated Carson, he pulled out the card and read, Ruby Hunter. She smiled. Was she supposed to be surprised? She gave her best shocked face, but from Olivia's look, she knew it wasn't working. Miss Hunter, 
and Miss Park will be the final two contestants, as Miss Justice has declined to be considered. Ruby turned to Olivia, eyes wide, looking for an explanation. He just wasn't meant for me, Olivia smiled, her look reassuring. Ruby didn't get a chance to question her further. A woman from the crew handed Darren a new envelope, and he pulled out another card. Ladies and gentlemen, before we see the outcome of our show, I have here the three names that were pulled up in the matchmaking process. If you'll remember, Love Austin, the matchmaking company helping to sponsor this show, ran the numbers on each of the ladies in relation to Carson. If their names are in this envelope, they will be awarded prize money for making it this far in the competition. He paused, trying to make it more dramatic. The third best match was Ashley Park. It says here to the side that you are able to connect with Carson empathetically. Darren paused and looked up at Ashley, a look on his face saying he didn't quite believe it. The second best match was Olivia Justice. Some of the characteristics you connected on was worldview and music selection. Darren smiled at Olivia and Ruby squeezed her hand. At least her friend would be getting some money for her troubles. And the overall best match for Carson Carver. Well, let's see. It says here his character is Captain Wentworth. Does anyone know what that means? Ruby could have sworn her heart stopped. Meg's words that she was Anne Elliot echoing through a megaphone in her mind. Anyway, Ruby Hunter is the overall match for our beloved hockey player. Congratulations, ladies. You win the prize money, and one of you still has the chance to win Carson's heart. How does she get money when she was already voted off? Cora asked, her lips in a tight line. You left the show voluntarily. Why do you care? Ruby was done with the drama. Cora's mouth opened and closed, no words coming out. The light on the camera went dead, and Ruby tried to control her breathing. How could she be the highest match for him? After all of these years and all the changes that had taken place in their lives, she just couldn't believe it. In, out. In, out. Echo, foxtrot. Dan's assistant, Alicia, walked over. Ashley, Ruby, please come with me. Two members of the crew followed them to a spot just out of reach of the spotlights. You'll each be taken to a spot here around the pond. Please don't move until you've received a letter from Carson. Sorry, did you say pond? Ruby asked the girl. Yes, this is Walden Pond. She paused and stared at Ruby. Are you feeling all right? Short of breath, Ruby managed to whisper, I'll be fine. She didn't know what her face looked like, but all the feeling had left her face and she shivered, blocking out memories she hadn't dredged up in years. Ashley was taken to the right, while Ruby moved to the left, a few steps behind her guide. The man left her a few feet from the water, and if she weren't in a beautiful dress, she would have sat down on the bank. So many emotions swirled through her. Why had the show changed the location of the finale to Walden Pond? Had Carson asked them to do it? Crew members were working quickly to get lights and electricity to where she was. Were they doing this over by Ashley as well? Calm down, girl. This could be a big hoax. Payback for what you did to him all those years ago. But then again, if he wanted to marry Ashley, she'd wish him luck. She didn't have room for resentment or regret anymore. The same crew member who'd led her to the spot came back this time with a small envelope in his hands. She thanked him and waited for the man to move out of sight before opening the envelope. My dearest Ruby, 
As I think back over the time we've shared on this show, I have to cringe at some parts. I wasn't always the nicest, but it was a shock seeing you again after all this time. The anger and resentment I felt towards you for breaking up with me needed to hear the explanation of why you'd done it. I want to apologize about being standoffish and about hurting you. I never meant to do so, and I hope you'll forgive me. You mentioned the fear of me being unfaithful if you were to become my wife. Ruby, you are the only girl I've ever truly loved. I know those words sound hollow with the stories of me kissing several of the women in the past few weeks, but know that when I kissed them, I was comparing them to you. None of the girls set off inner fireworks in me like you do. I hope you will forgive me that my deeds haven't always been stronger than my words during these past few weeks. But know that I love you. I don't think I ever stopped. Ruby paused, reading out loud for a moment, her eyes hovering over those three little words. Her eyes clouded over with tears, and she turned to stare out across the pond, the water barely visible from the dark blue sky above. As she looked around, she saw the view was familiar, and a sense of deja vu covered her. Raising a hand to her mouth, she inhaled sharply. Butterflies and regret filled her. If only she'd listened to her heart instead of every other person around her, she wouldn't be here, worried if she'd be with the man she loved more than she thought possible. She opened her mouth to read again when she heard a soft voice behind her, deep and soothing. Do you recognize this place? She spun around, seeing Carson walk out of the trees. Her lungs seemed to collapse, and she took small breaths, hoping she didn't look like an idiot. After nodding, she felt a tear streak down her cheek. I had planned how to get you out here for two weeks before I finally asked you. Standing here on this bank, I could see our future lined up and was never more excited than to know I'd found the one I would spend forever with. But when you gave me back the ring and said you couldn't marry me, it crushed that perfect image. It took months for the pain to numb, but when it did, I couldn't stop thinking about you. The tears streamed freely now, and she did her best to not scrunch up her face. She could hear the hum of some of the cameras, they were so close. But what was more important than how she was portrayed on the show was the man standing in front of her. When I first saw you walk out of that limo, I wasn't sure how to feel, how to act. But when I heard what you told Olivia and Stan the day I sent you home, I knew I had to tell you how I feel. He sank one knee down to the sand and his hand reached into his coat pocket, pulling out a small velvet box. Losing you was the hardest thing that's ever happened to me, aside from my parents' accident. I don't want to lose you again. I want to grow old with you, have kids with you. I want to build a life we love, hopefully out of the spotlight, as much as possible. He chuckled, and Ruby laughed, wiping away some of the tears. Ruby Dawn Hunter, will you marry me? With a smile and a few more tears, Ruby whispered, Yes. She pulled him up into a hug holding on as if he'd slip away like a dream. He pulled back and looked at her face. Did you say yes? His eyes showed his concern, and she laughed. This time, she made her voice clear. Yes, I'll marry you, Carson Carver. You're all I've ever wanted. The tenderness that washed over his face made her knees buckle, and she was grateful he was already holding on to her. Leaning forward, she felt the suspense as his lips finally met hers, soft at first and then humming with intensity. It was how she remembered his kisses, only so much sweeter as she realized how close she'd come to losing him. Pulling away, they both sucked in as much air as possible. She gave him a coy smile. You kiss as though you haven't in eight years. He gave her a quirky smile. Are you saying my kissing is bad? Ruby shook her head, loving the feel of his strong arms around her. 
No, I'm just saying it's like you had forgotten what kissing was like, and you poured everything into it. I'm a fan. Well, get used to it. I plan on kissing you every chance I can. Epilogue Olivia stood behind her, smoothing out the train. You look more amazing than a model on a bridal magazine. Carson is going to go crazy. It had been a whirlwind few weeks, but they were finally here, waiting for the queue to begin the procession. The day after the proposal, they'd appeared on the show Everything Your Heart Desires, and the hostess, Susie, had badgered them into spilling their wedding plans. With nothing official, Carson had said he wouldn't mind if they got married before the season started. And when Ruby agreed, the show had put together a wedding in less than a month. July 25th would be a day to remember. Ruby loved the dress, but what she loved most of all was this second chance at love. She thought about having the wedding at the Berkshire's cabin, as that's where they'd rekindled their romance. But Walden Pond held so many sweet memories of dating and both proposals that they'd decided to do it there. She stood near one of the camera trailers, breathing in the pine trees all around. It was as though they'd come full circle. Someone played the wedding march on a small piano they'd arranged to have brought out, and Ruby looked up at Brennan Peters, grateful he'd agreed to walk her down the aisle being one of Carson's closest friends. Her father had opted out of coming to the wedding, and at first she'd felt torn. But walking out and seeing Carson's face as he watched her walk down the aisle in her wedding dress made up for every ache and pain she'd sustained up until then. He was her family now, and she wasn't about to change her mind about that. The audience was small, but she preferred it that way. The other 11 girls from the show, Meg Austin and her fiancé Parker, Brennan's girlfriend Lexi, and a few others from when Carson and Ruby were growing up. Her eyes locked onto Carson's, and a thrill went through her. He was the one person she'd never felt whole without, and she couldn't look away. He smiled at her, a tear escaping down his cheek. She hoped she would feel her stomach flip each time he did that for the rest of their lives. She pictured their life, the house they'd bought near Walden Pond, and the memories they would be making together. She had never been so excited to get this day over with. The preacher's words didn't register in her head as she stared up at Carson. When he said, You may now kiss the bride, Carson took her face in both of his hands and gently kissed her lips the kind of kiss she'd missed all those years. You look beautiful, Mrs. Carver. You look pretty good yourself, Mr. Carver. He grinned and said, Are you ready for this? I've been waiting my whole life. They kissed again and ran down the aisle, never looking back. The End This has been... Austin Unscripted, A Second Chance Romance, Love Austin, Book 3, written by Brittany M. Mills, copyright 2019, narrated by Lorena Hoops, audio copyright 2020.